Inshallah, I would love to uh, start by maybe having a general discussion. And um, if you're here to learn about parenting, what are your uh, what would what are your questions in general? What would you love to learn, or you would expect me to speak about? Or if you have a a conflict or you have a problem, uh, either or you know someone who's having a problem with their children, what is that problem? How can we solve it? Uh, I will share with you whatever I know, and if I don't know, I'll say I don't know. So inshallah, uh, that's how I would like to start. So you can say, what would you have wanted to learn? That's number one. Number two, do you have a question? Do you know someone who has a question? Etc. Etc. So let's see who's the first volunteer. Welcome to the mic with you. Uh, to the mic with the mic. There you go. Assalamu alaikum. Mm -hmm. It's very really happy to see you back. We used to see you in MCA. Thank you, mashallah. So, uh, my question is, I have a teen boy who is in high school. So I come from a background where, you know, we listen to the parents. We don't talk back or, you know, give our opinion. We just follow what our parents say. Mm -hmm. But here, it's a different culture. So mm -hmm. we are in the middle where, you know, we come back, we get back with all the things that we have learned from parents. But uh, we see a different thing. Uh, from the kids. So, how to deal with that? Wonderful. So, I think everyone online, because this mic is also connected to the online, we came back, we came from an environment of uh, basically praising kids, indeed. So, how our kids, we never ask our parents, we never question them. Our children here ask us, question us, they have their opinions, etc., etc. Um, <clears throat> I say, short answer, if we can channel that question and answer in them, if we can channel it in the right direction, then inshallah our children will grow up better than us. Because you can see, like, without hurting anyone's feeling, our generation still did not deliver in the, the state of the Muslim world and the Muslim ummah is not, and that's our generation. So maybe, inshallah our children will be better than us. And part of being better than us is to ask, is to know, is to understand. To be disrespectful is not good, period. To, uh, but maybe, maybe, out of this asking and knowing because you took your you didn't ask your parents question because you took that from the society the social cues of the society guess who's your children taking their social cues from this society so do you want them to take that and not ask you a question or do you want them to ask you a question so that they know what to refer to right and they imagine your str your struggle is they ask you a question What's going to be their struggle when they have children? If they ask you and you give them the right answer, when their children ask them, who are your grandchildren, they will know what to answer. It's not going to work for them, nor is it going to work for the next generation that you don't ask, because that's not the social norm that we live in. So Alhamdulillah, I think if they ask and we channel that question in the right direction, and we answer them, then we have equipped them and empowered them to raise even the third generation who are our grandchildren, inshallah, Rabbil Alameen. A very good point, actually. One of the most repeated questions, actually. MashaAllah. Okay. Other questions? Sheikh, one question that I tend to get a lot in the community is, um, I was busy with my career, I was busy with my troubled marriage at a younger age, and we kind of not, did not inculcate Islam. And now my kids are teenagers and I feel like the boat's ship, the ship has sailed. And what can I do now that I've kind of woken up and seen the consequences of my actions, or inaction rather? Amazing. That's also a very good question, a very common question. My kids grew up, they're either teenagers or high school or college, and I feel it's too late. Uh, I would like to say it's never too late. It's never too late. Why? 
and how can you actually still have an impact on your children? You need to withdraw because now your kids are older, especially if they are done with university, for example, or they're in university. The time for you to give commands and they say, Sami'na wa ata'na is gone. You want them to listen to you, you have to establish now a new relationship. Come back, befriend them, talk to them, interact with them, become close, and then after that, um, they will they will see a whole other side of you. And inshallah, we will talk about that tomorrow in the three hours seminar because there's one hour dhuhr and lunch and this. So it's 10 to 2, but practically we'll end up probably of three hours of teaching. I will talk about specific dynamics. Barakallah feek, Shaykh Omar. Jazakallahu khayran. I'm so humbled. Ahsanallahu ilayk. Shakarallahu lak. Um, yes. So, how can you impact them? Establish a new relationship with them. Show them a side of you that they didn't see before. They've always seen you as a parent. You give commands and they say yes. And uh, now it's the time. The Arabs used to say, this is not a hadith and not an ayah. I repeat, this is not a hadith, this is not an ayah, but the Arabs used to say this. And some narration that Sayyidina Ali used, said that, that the Arabs used to say that. لَعِبْهُ سَبْعًا عَلِّمْهُ سَبْعًا صَاحِبْهُ سَبْعًا ثُمَّ دَعْهُ Teach him seven Play with your child for seven years. Teach them for seven years. Befriend them for seven years. Then leave them. Let them make their decisions. Even if they're going to make a mistake, let them make the mistake. And... We learned that from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did with Adam. He told him, this is the Jannah. Eat from what you want, but do not get close to this tree. But he also gave Adam the freedom of choice, the willpower. So Adam alayhi salam ate from the tree. Did Allah allow him to make that mistake? He, Allah didn't make him, that was his personal choice. But did he allow it to happen? Yes, why? So that Adam can learn. So then he learned how to make tawbah. And once he learned that Adam السلام, the iman, the tawheed, the la ilaha illallah of Sayyidina Adam was very clear. But Adam needed one lesson before he comes on earth. What did he learn? He need to learn, if I make a mistake, what do I do? What do I do? I know I should not be, I should not commit kufr. I know Allah is my Lord. That, I don't have a problem with that. But if I make a mistake, that is not kufr, that is not shirk, that is not denying Allah's existence. It's just a ma'asiyah. What do I do? So Allah gave him the space in Jannah to actually eat from the tree and then repent. Our problem is sometimes the hovering parents over parenting, over protection, not letting your child make a mistake. You will pay the price. They will want to run away from you as far as they can. And the only way after that for them to come back and listen to you is if you take that dynamic, throw it out and just say, okay, I, خلاص, I, I realize you're a full adult. You will make your choices. Um, if you want to make a choice that you know I don't like, just please don't make it in front of me. Go and make it somewhere else. But me and you are friends and you know, and, and, and I'm still your father. He still has to respect you or she has to respect you. But let's have a discussion. Then they will listen to you. You can't stop someone from making mistakes. Not possible. It didn't happen with Adam, alayhi salam. It's not going to happen with your child. That's a problem, you know. Let them make mistakes. And let them make mistakes under your roof so that they know how to deal with it. So that when they are not under your roof, they know what to do. That's exactly Allah made Adam make mistake under his sight. In this garden, when Adam السلام, went to earth, I mean, he's still under Allah's sight, but now Adam knows what to do with this mistake issue and sin and you know disobedience. So that's my answer. It's never too late to talk to your children. The problem is you keep on approaching them when they're old the same way you used to approach them when they were young. It will never work. Change the approach and you will have an impact on them. And if, by the way, if they 
don't listen to you immediately, you say, Sheikh, I, I listen to your advice. And they still didn't listen. I'm not promising you that they will listen. <laughs> but I'll tell you something. I'll tell you something. Allah put in us in Fatra that we love our children, our children love us. They will listen, maybe not in front of you. They will listen after you're gone. They will say, my father was right. My mother was right. You know the work of parenting. You become a hero when you're a parent. But just after you die, just wait a little bit. Inshallah, you will be a hero. Don't worry about it. Inshallah. So, good news. But just wait a little bit. They all realize, like, you know, oh, my father was right. Oh, my God, like this and that. Oh, I was foolish. But they will not happen. But what do you care? If your kid, you love your kid because he's your kid. If he's going to do what is right, whether when you are alive or after you die, khalas, alhamdulillah, you delivered. What do you, you want the result in front of you or you want the result period, whether sooner or later? So alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. Absolutely. I hope I answered that question clearly. Next question. Bismillah. So, salam alaykum, Shaykh. I want to ask about the specific situations like when if parents, some of oh, one parent came from as a refugee when they are young from a war zone and how this kind of made an impact on them or traumatized them to the point that that they are raising the kids to fear of everything and to everyone. They don't trust anyone, the kids. And how can you as uh, the other parent in this situation, because the kids are affected by this kind of beliefs that everyone is there is trying to get you and, and this kind of, like enmeshment. So your question started with what? I'm sorry, if you can start. Uh, about a parent who would come from a war zone when they are young and traumatized by several things happen to them uh, moving between countries until they arrived to U.S. made them feel kind of traumatized. No. Now this is moving to the children because the children are feeling that everyone is trying to get me and the parent because the parent is overprotective of the children like the point that you were trying to make. Mm -hmm. The question is if a separated parent in, the, in this case how can you react to the children are uh, are scared of everything and they don't want to be part of the community or anyone or yeah so obviously there's a general question and there's a specific question so if the parent comes to the masjid but the kid is scared then at least I'm talking to the parent but if the parent and the child are not here then I don't know how to answer that question right but let's assume the parent is here or the child is here how, what do we do with that? We say, if you are the parent, let's reason and let's talk about what you have instilled in your child of fear and this and that. One good news, Akhi, is that there is nothing that cannot be changed. Nothing. That's all in our head. And this whole notion that I grew up with this and that, and my parents did this to me, therefore I'm going to be the victim for the rest of my life. The whole way of talking like that has nothing to do with Islam or Muslim societies. It usually happens in non-Muslim societies they talk like that. Victimization for the rest of their, their lives. Islam, you want me to tell you what Islam does? Which you already know. You can, today, right now, before Maghrib, after Salat al-Jum'ah, the second Jum'ah. 81 years old took his Shahada. And he converted because his wife converted before him eight years before. And now he's, he ended up being diagnosed with stage four cancer, etc., etc. And he's saying, I'm converting because I saw the positive change in my wife. And the wife, they've been married for 54 years. Do you know what just happened to that guy? He changed at 81. Fresh, plain, new start at 81. No one can offer that except Allah. No religion on planet earth offers that except Islam. 
There is nothing that is too late to change. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu brought his father in his 80s on his shoulders to the Prophet and he said, please, Ya Rasulullah, give him shahada, give him shahada. Rasulullah said, if you told me, I would have came to him. This is an old man. He said, no, la anta ahaqqu an tu'ta, Ya Rasulullah. You're, you're more deserving that people come to you. And he gave the father of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq shahada in his 80s. So, a general answer to all of your questions, if you have this way of thinking that it's too late, it's never too late. I was just sitting with the converts in your community here. They converted in their 20s, they converted in their 30s, they converted in their 40s. Do you know what it means to convert from being a non-Muslim to Muslim? It's a whole life change, a whole different way of thinking, a whole different set of norms. If a non-Muslim kafir can become a Muslim and become better than all the Muslims in the world, then what about a born Muslim? Okay, the father scared the child, not a big problem. We can undo that in 40 days. It could be undone. But there has to be some willingness. Either the father is willing to change or the child is willing to change. If the people are willing to change, nothing cannot be changed. You can be 91 years old and you can change and meet Allah like this brother. We are all jealous of him. Qari Umar told him, I'm jealous of you. <laughs> 81 men and now Allah forgives all of your sins? Come on. Right? It's funny, right? So that's, that's who we are as Muslims. There is no way, there's no, there's no, it's too late. It doesn't exist. So, but your problem is very good, by the way, and your question is very good because I have seen, I'm Palestinian. Uh, my father, when my mother was pregnant from in with me, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, uh, Libya, then I was born. So I was in my mother womb already. My father moved five times. And when he went to Libya, I went to Western Libya, Tripoli. Then he went to Benghazi. Then I was born in Benghazi to a Palestinian parents. So did my father have like that, you know, okay, nervousness about him? Yes, he did. Yeah. Um, but you know, after I grew up, I can't, I, I can't even imagine now that I have many kids that I'm moving from one country to another for their safety and I don't even have a job yet until one year later after moving through five countries. So of course my father would have been a hard man. And, and before that he was in the PLO, right? In the, you know, and then before that he was in Palestine. My father was born 1931. He witnessed 1948 as a teenager. He witnessed 19... 56, he witnessed 1967, he witnessed 1971 in Jordan, 70, which is uh, September, black September, which was September before September 11, when Palestinians at Jordan is fought in, in Jordan. So I am a product of your question. And then I realized, okay, my father actually had the right to be like that because of what he went through. But then as he grew older, he became better and better. You know, they cooled down, right? And I was the youngest of five, so I got the, the least amount of pressure. <laughs> and, then, and then I moved on. Then I had to change myself, myself, right? Uh, to make sure that I took the best from my father and evolved to even a better person. Because at the end of the day, the beauty of Islam, your parents are not your, the, end, the end role model. Allah has given us Prophet Muhammad He's our end model. And you know, He's the only one that if you tell your father, I don't want to be like you, I want to be like the Prophet, your father will smile. He will not insult him. If your daughter says, I don't want to be like you, I want to be like Khadija, please be my guest. We have role models, and as we will see uh, tonight and tomorrow, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept an opening Allah did not make the children the slaves of their parents. And Allah did not give full, like, blank check, obey your parents no matter what. You know, and this is always how I usually start, is that most of us, Muslim parents, this is what we said to our children when, when we get frustrated and they're not listening. Allah said in the Quran, listen to your parents. So, listen to your parents. I, we have so many Mus'haf here, and we have Hafiz. Where does it say in the Quran where Allah said, listen to your parents? 
Do you know it doesn't exist? It exists in a different way, in an implicit way. Allah told us in the Quran, if your parents push you to disbelieve in me, deny my existence, or associate partners with me, or commit ma'asiyah, disobedience, then do not obey them. So the first shock to the parents is, I always, you know, kind of shock their system, is in the Quran there is no, Allah didn't say, listen to your parents. In the Quran, Allah said, don't listen to your parents. So then I become very popular with the youth, and then the parents get upset with me, and then the rest is history, right? But actually, I will show you how it's very beautiful. Let me, so before the youth get too excited and they go far with this, Allah told us in the Quran in Surah Luqman, وَإِن جَاهَدَاكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُشْرِكَ بِي مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ If they push you to commit shirk and to do an action that you have no knowledge of, which means shirk, kufr, and ma'asiyah, فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا So then do not obey them. Now here is the beauty of the Quran. If Allah Azza wa Jal in the Quran said, Obey your parents, it would have ruined the relationship between parents and children. Because we would have ended up with a relationship based on what? Dynamics and robotics and master-slave, master-slave, master, I command, you obey, I command, you obey. So we would not end up with a relationship. I will explain to you tonight and tomorrow night, especially tomorrow, the dynamics of parenting, very beautiful. Allah established a very rich relationship between parents and children that will make you friends to the day you die. You will love your kids and your kids will love you. You just have to follow the Quran and not play it smart and not say, this is my culture. You just have to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what did Allah say? You walk into this store, you walk into this store. It's selling juice right and left. You look at your child and you say, this and this and this juice, do not drink it. It's haram. It has alcohol in it. What did you just tell your child? Huh? Every and thing else is halal. Do you know how smart is the Quran? That Allah told us in the Quran, if your parents tell you to do kufr, shirk, and ma'asiyah, then do not obey them. What's the message? Everything else, you listen. So that's why young children don't get too excited, right? <laughs> But the way Allah said it, implicit, why? So that Allah will not create a relationship that is not good. Because Allah wants so many th other things to kick in so that the relationship between parents and children is not only listen to me, Allah said in the Quran, obey me, so obey me, don't ask questions. Right, that was your question. Don't ask questions, don't argue, don't say anything, just do as I say. That's not gonna go far. That's not gonna go far, meaning, it will not deliver results, and that's not gonna go far, meaning you will not have a long-term relationship with your kid. It will break, and it will break your heart. And, and I'm telling you, I'm a father, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. My oldest is 24, my youngest is three years old. So I have all of them in all the range, and every three years there is. So I know all the ages at all the styles, and I, Alhamdulillah, now I can see what worked and what didn't work with my you know, you're always your first child is the guinea pig. You do all the experimentation with them. And then the second is better and the third is better and the fourth is better. So, but alhamdulillah, Allah, if you are sincere, even your mistakes that you make as a, ch with, as a parent, Allah will fix your mistakes for you. Don't, don't worry. Like, oh, I messed up with my oldest kid. It's don't worry. Repent to Allah Azza wa Jal. Fix your ways to match the Quran and your kids will be the best kids out there. Don't worry. There's nothing unfixable. There is nothing that khalas damaged for life. No, nothing. We are Muslims, alhamdulillah. We have, you know, we don't have like the father when drinking, came home and did something to the child. And things can go from beating to breaking bones to raping. That's what we deal with. We don't have that as Muslims, at least majority of our homes. So all of your problems with your kids are fixable ta'ala. It's just if you're doing something wrong, stop doing what you're doing. Insan the definition of insanity that you keep on doing the same thing expecting different results. Don't do that.
Stop doing. Allah, Al-Quran, ahakku an yuttaba'a. The Prophet is ahakku an yuttaba'a. Which means, the Quran and the Sunnah has more claims on us. They, they are the one that we need to follow. Not, wallah, my father said this and my culture says that. No, the truth prevails over every culture in the world, right? So that's the situation. So, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, I... Uh, uh, that's the answer to your question. Uh, any other question? Mashallah. Please go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you for being here, Shaykh Abu Fri. Wa alaikum as um, I had a question of uh, technology for kids mm -hmm. in terms of your recommendations for children in this mm -hmm. day and age with such a plethora of Absolutely. things and kids having it. Thank you. You're welcome. With my children, I have applied a policy, no phone before age 16, period. And, and alhamdulillah, it paid off. And after 16, the first year, it's a phone under supervision, meaning parental control, like through the mechanisms of Apple or anyone else. And then after one year, you give them full control because you want the last year, 17 to 18, while they're still under your roof to make all the mistakes, remember? So 16, no phone. 16 to 17, phone with restrictions. 17 to 18, complete access. Let them mess up the world under your supervision. Then you can advise and you can say, you know this, you know that. Let's try, let's see things, let's this, this, that. Because, you know, they're going to become 18. Only a fool does not plan ahead of time. One of the most beautiful things I heard in America, and it matches the Quran and Sunnah, failing to plan is planning to fail. It was. So, I want my kid to do the mistakes while I'm there, because 18, they can leave if they want to. Obviously, we, we, we love to keep our children. All of my children stayed home after 18. Um, but and, 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 and I could see their struggle. So one of the things that tonight's lecture is the reframe and refrain. And, and, and one of the things that I want to say, refrain, right? Because it's a reframe is the mindset, and that's what I wanted to start with. Uh, reframe are the four things that you need to refrain from. You need to, up, to up, refrain from that and apply a positive policy. Refrain from giving them unlimited access to electronics for known reasons. Instead, you know, let, let them, for example, use your TV at home to watch uh, Islamic cartoons, uh, learn Arabic also through cartoons. Even if your family's mother tongue is not Arabic, let them learn Arabic through cartoons. Uh, watch Islamic uh, movies, Islamic history. Connect your children to watching nature documentaries. It's very beautiful and it enriches them. Uh, and mashallah, they did an amazing job with these documentaries. Uh, um, let them watch the stories of the prophets. Let them watch this, let them watch that. So you, 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 you make them use electronics that everyone is using, the, the, the TV or the laptop screen that you're showing them, uh, Islamic cartoons, nature movies, documentaries, this and that, until they reach 16. And then as I said, 16, you give them a phone, but with parental control, because you know you wanna have them go soft landing. So number one, refrain from electronics. Number two, grow up as parents and refrain from arguing and fighting in front of your children. It changes them. I was just watching a video yesterday. Inshallah, I'm gonna try to locate it again and show it to you. They did this as an experiment, like barely a one-year-old. Mother is playing this and that, and she's giving him toys, and he's playing with the toys, and this and that. And suddenly, they make the other parent walk in. It's an experiment, control experiment, and the, the father start arguing with the mother. He just like argued two, three sentences. Why are you doing this? We don't want, there is just something non-related. And then the mother went back and tried to play with the child with these uh, toys. And the child was completely in a state of panic. Like, 
and that's one year old. The child doesn't even know how to talk. So if you decided to get married and have children, grow up and up deploy one of three things. Go and figure out your fights and problems, not in front of the children. That's an immediate solution. Number two, go and find marriage counseling, a sheikh, an imam, work on yourself, self-development, so, you, uh, so that you can improve your way of life, and, and everyone should do that. And number three, if it's completely, completely, completely impossible, and you're constantly at the throat of each other, then apply the Quran, in which depart from each other, but with ihsan. It's one of the most fascinating high uh, levels in the Quran that Allah said, فَإِمْسَاكٌ بِمَعْرُوفٍ أَوْ تَسْرِيحٌ بِإِحْسَانٍ Live together in ma'roof or leave each other with ihsan. Now everybody knows that ihsan is higher than ma'roof. So it's almost Allah saying in the Quran, divorce on better terms than, even, than when you were married. Like let the divorced relationship be better than the married relationship. Why? Because when you're divorced, خلص, you, you, they don't have to listen to you, you don't have to listen to them. So now the relationship is unloaded, you unloaded the stress. خلص, become friends, يعني brother and sister for the sake of Allah, and raise these children peacefully. The problem is one of the two wants to teach the other person a lesson through the children. I don't know, we can't control that situation. Nobody can control that. Even in the Muslim countries, they cannot control that. If someone wants to play it tough and this and and, and want to play it evil, nobody can stop them. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects the believers to fear Allah, to be God-fearing meaning. خلص, it's not working, yeah. it's like fight, 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 fight. Okay, so then they say, I don't have to listen to you as a husband, you don't have to listen to me as a wife. Let's depart, focus on the kids, and we become best brother and sister in the name of Allah, and let's raise these children. I will not deny you to see your children. I will not deny you to see your children. And in, within the Islamic fiqh, children go with the mother. For the boys until puberty, then they're given a choice. For the girls, they stay with the mother. So this whole custody battle is un-Islamic. Custody is always with the mother, unless the mother is mentally ill, or physically completely ill, or uh, 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 that completely left Islam or something, and she's trying to push the kids to leave Islam, then you can, the kids can go with the father. But normally, normal situation, kids go with the mother, and the mother does not deny the father to see his kids. So now you're living in ihsan, better than when you were married. Because when you were married, you were at the throat of each other. If the husband and wife fear Allah, and they became divorcee, the kids will win. But 99% of the time, the parents are not able to do that. Choice number one, fight away from the kids. Settle your score somewhere else. Choice number two, go and seek um, uh, counseling. Step number three, leave each other and become the best brother and sister in the name of Allah for the sake of raising, raising these kids without fights. You don't do one of these three things, you're going to have to answer to Allah on the Day of Judgment. Not to me, not to anyone. We cannot stop you. But there is, by in God's name, there is heaven and there is hell. And if you make another person go through hell, Allah will make you go through hell. <laughs> and Allah's hell is way much more painful than the hell of this world. So don't do that to each other. خلص, back off. Well, it's not working. Salamu alaikum. So refrain from what? Refrain number one, from electronics. Refrain number two, from fighting in front of the kids. Refrain number three, can you handle this one? In my judgment, and this is my personal opinion, refrain number three from sending your kids to public school after the last two years, because the dynamics and the curriculum changed in public schools. So now a five years old has to learn something, and you know what I'm talking about. So, so what do we do, Sheikh? Two things. You send them to an Islamic school. If you cannot afford it or it's not possible, you homeschool. And homeschooling does not mean schooling at home. That's the mistake. I don't know the math of high school. I don't know either. And my entire life with my children, either Islamic school or homeschooling. Sometimes I couldn't afford the Islamic schooling, so I homeschool. Homeschooling, you get a, a funding from the government. You take that funding, you sign up with a charter school that offers services. 
You take your kid to math class, you take your kid to English class, take your kid to science class, you take your kid to social studies, take your kid to activities. Then your kid can go do horseback riding, archery, swimming, all at the expense of this check. Your kid will have the time of their lives. And if the mother, one of the parents, dedicate themselves to homeschooling, you're going you're gonna to have a best friend in your life. You go together swimming, you go you know, to horseback riding, archery, this and that and then chess club, and then this club, and that club, your kids will grow up genius, because now they don't have to be in a class, 25 to 40 kids per class. In these home cl schooling classes, the number of kids is five to 10. Your kid will get the best education you've ever dreamt of and he ever, with no stress. So now, homeschooling does not mean schooling at home. Homeschooling meaning you sign up for a professional service and there will be professional teachers teaching your child. The only thing is your child is not in this jail and incubator inside the school where he's constantly under peer pressure. And now forget peer pressure, the curriculum is teaching them something that they should not learn. Why a five years old should learn about this gender issue? Do you know Islam is completely neutral? Children below below puberty up to age 10 boys and girls play together then you don't talk to them about their gender anyway you don't talk to them about it after 10 they start paying attention to their identity consciousness start kicking in at 10 fully kicks in by puberty 11 12 13 difference between boys and girls and difference between different nationalities and regions when do kids hit puberty so the idea here is the third thing, do not send, refrain from sending your kids to public school. And this, uh, two years ago, I stood up at MCC and I said, I will not meet Allah. And you tell Allah on the Day of Judgment, our Imam did not tell us that we should not do that. So I know I'm going to upset you all. This two years ago happened and a war erupted at MCA because I said, I'm giving you the fatwa from me, and you don't have to listen to my fatwa, that you should not send your kids to public school. We have so many options, and if you want to know how you can handle, come and ask me, I'll send you in the right direction. Eruption happened, then after that, parents started learning, then all of the people who came at, against my word, they all became my biggest fans right now. And they thank me every day and night, you know, Jazakallah khair ya Oh my God, oh my God, we would have lost. Oh my God, my friend didn't listen to you and she is now in so much pain and suffering. Jazakallah khair. So that's the whole thing. There is an option out there. Don't think. And, and, and if I allow myself to continue talking about this topic, it will shock your system. Because you live in America, you don't know America. You don't know the educational system in America. You need to learn where you live. Do you know if you are 18 years old plus one day, the university will not ask you if you have a high school or not? Do you know who needs a high school in America? Someone who's applying for university under age 18. Do you know that or you don't know that? Do you know that when the community colleges were established and university in America, 90% of the population didn't have even middle school? So the Americans are very smart and very practical. So to make people go to college without any fear, they told them, listen, you don't need high school, forget it. Just come to college. Hey, I have elementary, that's okay. So what do I need? You enter any college in America, 18 years plus one day, they sit you down, you take placement test. English and math only. Tayyib, you failed. You're not at a college English and math. Every community college in America has three levels of math and three levels of English below college level. Like you are one level below, two levels below, three levels below. But what if you are so out of it that you didn't even score within the three levels below? Then it is the government and the state job to hire a private tutor for you to get you to the lowest level. Do you know that about America or you don't know? You don't know. You don't know where you're living. You stress the living daylight out of your kids in high school, thinking that their high school is going to get them to the Ivy League. You need to study where you are. What's the percentage of acceptance 
to UC Berkeley from Cupertino. You know Cupertino, where everybody wants to go to Cupertino, and I don't know, Steve Jobs, and Apple donates the public school. What's the percentage of acceptance? If you apply from Cupertino High School to UC Berkeley, what's the level chances to getting? Five to 10%. What's your level of acceptance if your kid went to the two years of community college and went to De Anza? What's the percentage of them being accepted? 70 to 80%. You fail your kid when you send them to high school. They will most likely not be accepted in UC Berkeley. But you don't know that because nobody has time to look at the system. Do you know that the way American education is designed is it's the same curriculum the last two years in high school and the first two years of community college. Do you know that they study exactly the same thing? So what's the point? Do you know that your kid, by the end of the first year, ninth grade, ninth grade, the end of the first year of high school, if your kid, you didn't send him to high school, you took him and you applied tutoring for him, very simple, light-hearted tutoring, that your kid, any kid in, in, in this, because it's so easy, they can learn the four years of math, and the four years of English, and the four years of science, and the four years of social studies in one year. Okay, then what do we do, Sheikh? Then you go to the state of California. Every month there is a high school test. It's called CHASPI, California High School Proficiency Exam. Do you know what happens if you pass that exam? You get California High School Diploma. Do you know what you do with that diploma? You skip the pain and suffering of four years in high school and you go straight to college and you start applying to documentary college. All my top three kids went through the system. My daughter just turned 17 in November, and she's already done with the first year of college, and she's on her second year. By the time she's 18, she's done with the first two years college, and she has high proficiency. Her two brothers, both of them got accepted to UC Santa Cruz. So don't think I'm a sheikh that, oh, education is not important. Just tawakkalna ala Allah. Let's go and memorize the Quran. My kids all went to memorizing Quran. None of them finished the memorization, and that's fine with me. But they, the first two top got accepted in UC Santa Cruz, one in cognitive science and one in computer science. So what I'm telling you is not, I'm not trying to sacrifice your kid's education. I'm, not, I'm trying to show you that you don't need to lose your kid in high school because the most dangerous experience in the, in the American experience is the high school experience. Even American parents lose their mind, who are not Muslim, and they're not religious at all. They lose their mind when their kids go to school. They don't know what to do anymore. Not you and me. No, no, no. The one who has zero haram in his life doesn't know what to do. So don't think you are the only one who's this. So when you don't know anything about Chespi exam, you don't know that your kid can go straight to, to forward to the community college. You don't know that your kid doesn't even need a high school. You don't know that community college gives him a higher percentage of acceptance in Yale, Harvard, Brown, Princeton, and MIT, and then the UC system. Then you're going to act and you're going to lose your kid for nothing. So please educate yourself. There's solutions out there. So refrain from electronics, refrain from family problems, refrain from public education, right? And I, I'm telling you, good news are coming with Trump coming. He's gonna completely defund and close the Department of Education, which means most likely very soon, every student, and then they are telling the states, you cannot force your education on the kid, so very soon, the parents used to receive 3,500, 2,200 to 3,500 from the state of California if you decide to homeschool your kid. Pretty soon, you're going to get a fat check of $10,800 that you can take and go to an Islamic school, deposit your kid, or take that and apply it into homeschooling. So congratulations. We have good news coming our way. <laughs> Number four, refrain from what? Let me look at my notes. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Yeah. The fourth one is refrain 
from basically trying to upbring your children and grow them and raise them without a clear, clear goals, clear plan, which I said failing to plan is planning to fail. Refrain from, uh, from a no plan plan. You need to have a plan. You need to have your goals, your, 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 your targets, your tasks, and your plan ready. Because if you don't do that, you will always be 10 steps behind your child. And they will play you very good. You need to be 10 steps ahead of your child. How do you do that? You're in constant knowledge of what's happening to their age level. And you're constantly planning and planning and planning and planning and planning. So I do encourage that, for example, whether you have boys and girls, like what, small tip about planning, load them with physical activities. Load them with competitions. Good. Put them in robotics and let them enter competitions. Put them in martial arts and let them enter competitions. Put them in team sports. Big, big issue because they, they need to learn to become a team player. And now, mashallah, there is accommodation for all the sisters with the hijab in all the teams. And if, uh, if you're, the team rejects you because you're a Muslim and you're wearing hijab, please come and talk to me because both of us are going to get rich. Because we will sue the living daylight out of them. And we will make millions. So don't worry. So the, day, the, the issue is, for example, one of the things that parents don't see that is important is that sports and team sports and competitions. What happens if your child never participates in competitions? They grow up like uh, with low self-esteem. Nothing like, you know. So it's like, I never won any competition in my life. You know? Why should I compete? I'm not used to that culture. The culture of competing and winning, competing and winning, competing and winning, right? When you put them in, uh, in, in horseback riding, let them compete. If you put them in swimming, let them compete. If you put them in soccer, let them compete. Teamwork, competition, teamwork, competition. It will make, yani, you know, when the kid, what's happening right now, the, the number one, my kid is on the phone and at home. And I'm just completely paralyzed. And I cannot take their phone away. Do you know why? Because growing up, they don't have competition. Do you know if your kid is hooked up to the idea of competition, they will not sit at home and sit on their phone and swipe. They will not even have the time to do that. So sometimes you think it's like the Islamic is some magical Islamic solution. There's no magical Islamic solution. Your kid is either busy or not busy. When you're not busy and you've got so much time on your hands, you're up to a lot of trouble. You're going to get in a lot of trouble. When you're busy, this, what's the difference most of the time when I'm doing counseling? The kids that, may Allah protect your kids and our kids, they end up with drugs. Be it this, you know, the entry, the gateway, which is marijuana, which is the most destructive drug on the planet. And, you know, they're just making money out of it with taxes and this and that and legalizing it. But it's the gateway. Who, who wants to smoke marijuana and become lazy? Someone who's not in a competition. Your kid cannot get into that stuff if they are in a physical demand and competition. Right? So this is very, very important something. So refrain from not having a plan. Also, you know, when they memorize Quran, competition. Competition is where you sit down and smile and your kid says, I don't have time, I don't have time. And you're like, why? Oh, I got this competition. I got, oh, okay, okay. I'm sorry to disturb you. I'm going to close the door. And you go and drink your tea and call your friends and have a good time. Because your kid is not up to trouble. Your kid is busy with competition. When you don't plan for these things, then your kid has a lot of time. Then he's sitting down and he's telling you, I'm depressed. I don't know what to do, etc., etc. So failing to plan. Do refrain from raising your kids without clear goals tasks, plans, activities, sports, and, 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 and with, that, with that, one of the benefits is you end up choosing the, ch the friends of your children before they choose them. Because who were they raised with? And that's, you know, and that's part of planning and that's part of what we will be talking about, inshallah, Rabbil Alameen. So basically, uh, these are the four refrains. 
uh, that I had prepared for tonight. And tonight's lecture is reframe and refrain. So uh, the reframe, inshallah, uh, as now it's 654. Is anyone having a, another question, last question? Because we pushed this from 7 to 9. Go ahead, please. Okay. And then there's uh, a lot of people watching online. They have some questions to share. So. Oh my God. Okay. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam. Um, quick question. So, how do you deal with like the 10 year old age group that doesn't listen? Mm -hmm. That you have to repeat, say, I don't know, cleaning up your room. Mm -hmm. You have to repeat it like a hundred times, mm -hmm. you know? How do you deal with a child who, like, uh, for example, like me and my husband, we have a little bit different styles of parenting. Okay. But I feel like he, they, my, my children end up respecting him and listening to him mm -hmm. with him telling them like one time, but he's a little bit more forceful. I tend to be like, like, come on, you guys, like, let's clean it up or whatever. And, um, and I feel like he's succeeding even though he's more forceful and I try to be more lenient. And I'm like, oh my God, they're not listening. Indeed. So what's How old advice? is 16? No, no, 10 year old. 10 years old, yeah. okay. So the short answer, apply your husband's style. One of the biggest mistakes that we do, and thank you for asking a question, I was hoping someone would ask that question. It's one of the biggest mistakes that we do as parents is we keep on repeating the same command. If you repeat the same command more than like a reminder, one time and a one time reminder, and if you say if you reach to a level where you have to say to your child you have to listen to me listen to me then you already started failing stop saying listen to me do it do one time and for excuse you can do second time if the person does not do cold-blooded you start pulling things or adding things there's no listen to me twice do you know who says listen to me Someone who's weak. That means you are out of power and you literally reveal yourself to your child that I, I don't know how to control you, so please listen to me. Oh no. They should be dreaming at night thinking what is my mom or dad going to do next if I don't listen. They should be trying to figure you out, not you trying to figure them. They should not figure you out. Like you should be like this mysterious, like my mom is crazy. That's good. But crazy, not in a mean of screaming and beating. Crazy means she's cold blooded. I didn't clean my room. I don't know. I didn't get a lunch or I, I was not allowed to leave the house on the weekend. No screaming, no yelling, no anger. Why am I not going? Because you didn't clean your room. And you cannot, once you put a punishment, you cannot change it. Don't change it. And the word punishment, I don't like it. But it, because, you know, it's not punishing. Like you put a consequence. Once you put a consequence, stick with it. And go over your motherly instinct and your motherly love. And go with it. And let them cry. But don't do it 100 times. Just do it one time a year. To remind them that you are in control. Oh, you don't want to listen? Oh, no problem. And then he's not going to know what is going to hit him. Next time he's going to think 10 times before not listening. So the best technique is don't repeat yourself. Don't say, come on guys. And don't say, listen to me or please listen to me. Or I am your parent or Allah said in the Quran, listen to me. That's all the helpless technique. Your word is one word. And then the kid will know 15,000 things could go wrong if I don't listen. And they are cold-blooded. And cold-blooded because you don't want to scream and yell and this and this and that. And, and then, you know, they can cry, they can yell, they can do this. You, you start saying, oh, you're doing this? Okay, another day of grounding. Uh, you said this? Okay, another day. Okay, you want to try me out? We'll go for a month. We'll go for a year. Try me out. If you can go for the one day, that's it. Your kid will break apart and will start listening. So your your husband saying it one time, firm, etc., etc. Yes. Uh, in, how about in terms of salah in that age? You know, again, you you should have done some homework between age seven and ten. 
uh, I am against forcing kids to pray before age seven. If they feel like it, let them come and join you. If they don't feel like it, do not let them join you. I had a parent stop me in the MCA, and very distressed, thinks he's the biggest failure in the world. What happened? He said, my six years old stopped coming and praying next to me, and now I have to force him. I said, please, don't do that. What do you do about, about the deen more than Allah? قُلْ أَتُعَلِّمُونَ اللَّهَ بِدِينِكُمْ Allah and his messenger said, start teaching them at age seven and discipline them at age 10. Well, where are you starting? Three? Age three? He said, yes, I started at age three. I was like, oh man, I was exaggerating. So obviously, the kid خلاص, doesn't want to pray. And subhanAllah, I'm witnessing that now with my daughter between age three uh, to uh, between age three to five. She's so excited to pray with me. خلاص, six kid, I don't want to pray with you. Please, don't. But she sees me pray. She sees her mother pray. She sees her brother pray. She sees her sister. She starts playing around us. I know it, she's going to come around. But I will never create a problem in her head. <gasps> you don't want to pray. The child doesn't understand that. The child just want to play. And Allah said they're not mukallaf. You're going to create a new religion and make them mukallaf? Mukallaf means responsible, held responsible. Held responsible is from the age of puberty. From seven to eight, the tahbib and the understanding and why do we pray and what do we pray and this and that. And that's why like, we have a whole course uh, at Tawasaw for children. We call it the beauty of Salah. Our goal is to make kids fall in love with Salah, not to force them. And we teach the parents how to follow up after that one day event. It's just a one day event, two, three hours and then, but it has a big impact on the children. Their first introduction to Salah should be happiness and, and this and that, which they already have at home. But if your kid started praying with you at age three, two, three, four, five, and at age six says, I don't want to pray, don't worry. Now, at the age of 10, you need to educate the wisdom of Salah. Why do we pray? How do we pray? This and that. And then how do we organize our day around prayers? And then how prayer is not an option. So tell them, would you like to stop eating? What if I stopped you from eating? No more. How many times you eat a day? People say three. I say, give me a break. Nobody eats three times a day in America. Five to six times. So just like you feed your body five to six times, you have to pray five to six times. Very simple. It's eating food for the soul. We have Allah gave you, you have to say thank you. Very simple. Don't, the, the problem is you make your kid resentful. You make your kid think of himself Oh, I don't like to pray. Don't tell your kid you don't like to pray. Don't tell your kid you hate prayers. Don't tell your kid you're not good with prayers. You've just fed their spongy mind something about themselves that is not true. He's going to live for the rest of his life saying, I hate prayers. Because you told him that. Don't tell him that. Don't say you don't. Tell him, come on, you love prayers. I don't love it. No, you love it, but you don't know. Do you think your kid will be 10 for the rest of his life? If he constantly hear, no, I love Salah, no, I love Salah, no, Salah is beautiful, oh, Salah connects us with Allah. He's, he's, gonna, he's not going to be 10 for the, he's going to grow up and life is going to hit him and he will become praying. But when the system of the whole house, everybody is praying, it's, it, it, I feel it should be implicit. Everybody, time to make wudu, time to get Salah and then have dinner. If you don't get up, make wudu and make salah, there is no food. Ma'as salama, you know, that's at around 10, right? But I will never tell my kids something about themselves that is not true and make them hate their religion and hate themselves because of what I said to them. Your kid didn't feel praying for a month. Next month he will start praying. Insha'Allah, Rabbil Alameen. Yes? Yes, Brother Munir is here, inshallah. We are in the process of bringing, inshallah, Tawasaw, which is our organization, to MCC, inshallah. And uh, that will happen in coordination with Brother Munir and the MCC, inshallah. Assalamualaikum, <sighs> Sheikh. I yes. have one question. Going back to your homeschooling, would you recommend that from preschool, starting at preschool, or just focus on high school? 
at any age, at any age. Um, Subhanallah, they say from age one to age six, and some say from age one to age eight. Kids are recording, 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 recording. And then for the rest of their life, after eight, nine, or ten, they're only replaying the what was recorded. That's why they call it the formative years. So if my child is preschool, what do I want him to record? Imagine the songs are Islamic songs. The surahs are from the Quran. The hadith is from the Quran. The song, the cartoon, they're recording, 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 recording. By age six, some psychologists say six, some say eight, some say ten. They stop recording and they start playing. The rest of their life they're playing. You know? So now, what do you want them to record? What are they observing around them in their head and ear? So I do see that the earlier the better, and the more we record some Islam in their subconscious, the better it is. Inshallah, Rabbil Alameen. Um, yes. And it has to be good Muslim school. Yes. Do you want to start your talk or do you want to take one yes. online question? If there is a question online, if you can read them all back to back and then so that we respect the people online. Well, some okay. of them are pretty long. How about we just do one, Sheikh? Okay. Okay. Assalamu alaikum, dear Sheikh. My question is about parents' accountability on the day of judgment for upbringing of their kids. We are working very hard to keep our kids on the straight path, but I'm worried about the second and third generations. In case one of these generations goes astray from Islam, how far will we, as the first generation who planted the seed, be accountable for that? Of course, there is an issue of living in a non-Muslim country without any valid reason, but that's a whole dis separate discussion. Yes, so alhamdulillah, we answered your question. If you raise your kids with the Muslim community, this is a community work. It takes a village to raise a child. You need all the khalas in the world, or the ammos in the world, or the uncles and aunts. And inshallah, I don't know of anything in Islam that says you're responsible for generations to come unless you actually did not do your job. But what I would say, the time to fool around has ended two years ago. The time of taking things easy ended two years ago. We're talking about right now of your kid has a confusion about his gender they will make him have a confusion. It's not like he has a confusion. No, no, they will make sure he has a confusion. They will make sure he has a confusion about his God, ilah, la ilaha illallah. They will make sure that he has a confusion about do I have a religion and principles or just do I do whatever I like? They will make sure that he has a problem of following ethics and morals and manners and character. They will make sure that he has confusion. Does he even want to continue? going to school and becoming somebody or not. They will not leave your kid until they've made them confused and doubtful about everything in life that should be basic, stable, bedrock. La ilaha illallah. I love my parents. My parents are always there for me. Islam is my religion. Quran is the word of Allah. I have a role model called Muhammad Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, I'm, I know what I want to do. I want to benefit humanity. I want to build myself. I want to earn halal. I want to grow up. And as you grow your ideas, I want to get married, you know, but that happens after you grow up, this and that. These are the bedrock of this family, God, religion, parents, uh, 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 accomplishment in life, character, morals and manners. They will make your kid doubt his name. They, they, the kid will start wanting to change his name. No, it's, it's, this is what we're dealing with. So, you know, be, starting counseling in, in 1995, 96, every five years, the counseling goes into a more dangerous era. The questions that I used to get between 1995 to 2000 is one. 2000 to 2005, 2010 is another. 2010 to 2020 is another. And now we are a whole different charter territory. Everything is up for discussion right now. No, nothing is. So I say, knowing that reality, do your best. 
take advantage of your community, take advantage of what America offers you, of what homeschooling offers you, of what American universities offer you, take advantage of that. Learn how you can navigate the system to your advantage. And the beautiful thing about America, you, as long as you're within the legal framework and you're not doing anything illegal, nobody has beef with you. The way we are fed up is the same way our Christian brothers are fed up, the same way as the Jewish community is fed up, the same way as the Mormons are fed up, everybody's fed up. So we're not an anomaly anymore. Don't feel alone. Everybody is like, so and the American system allows you to go figure out your thing. So let's not act like we're helpless and we don't have a, ch a choice. We do have a choice. But you just have to put your heart in the choice. You know, parents, they just want to drop the kids and, and not get involved. The days for that are gone. You want to continue to do that? Go back home. And unfortunately, I don't know if back home works right now anymore to, to throw your kid in the public school. Even back home, you know, is worse than here. <laughs> here we have beautiful, you know, multinational, all loving one another. You go there, you go, oh, discrimination based on your last name. And I'm talking Muslim on a Muslim, right? So, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. So, we have choices here. Put your time, put your effort into it, insha'Allah, Rabbil Alameen. So, are we good? We can start, insha'Allah. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I mean, I covered part of the lecture. So, <clears throat> I want you to, you know, the first frame that I want to put in your head is, SubhanAllah, Allah made our lives easy. We wanted to get married. We found a spouse. We got married. We wanted to have children, Allah gave us children. We wanted boys, Allah gave us boys. We wanted girls, Allah gave us girls. And as Allah said, He gives some girls only, He gives some boys only, and He gives some boys and girls, and He gives some no children. And that's Allah's will, right? That's fine, we accept Allah's will. So, but what I noticed in the Quran is how much Allah considers giving you children is a blessing. Like you're blessed to have children. I mean, I, I, I can't wrap my head around this. Like Sayyidina Zakaria alayhi salam crying his whole life and he doesn't have children. <laughs> Finally, he said, my hair turned white and my bones are weak. Yani, it's the most interesting statement. Do you know what Zakaria is saying? I'm old from inside, I'm old from outside. <laughs> The hair is white and the bones are weak. Yani I'm not like, you know how some people, their hair is white, but they're still in their 40s and they're still bodybuilders. La, la, la. Zakaria is well in his 70s. My bones are cold, old and my hair is white. But I still want a child. And finally, Allah gives him a child, Yahya alayhi salam. Man, I don't remember making that much dua to have a child. We just got it easy. I see, I see in the Quran, Ibrahim alayhi salam asks Allah for 82 years. <clears throat> Ibrahim alayhi salam in the hadith mentioned that he circumcised himself at age 80. Then Allah granted him Ismail. <laughs> Sarah told Ibrahim alayhi salam, we're not having children. We're both becoming old. Maybe Allah promised you a child not through me. Why don't you marry Hajar? And if she has a child, we all raise the child. Khalas. Imagine the sacrifice Sarah السلام, had. Like what woman will say her husband to say her husband, go and get married. And then she say, maybe through this wife you will get children. Like that takes a lot of maturity and iman for a woman, for a man to say that. For, for a woman to say that. Subhanallah. And it truly happens. He marries Ibrahim Isa marries Hajar, and they have a child. I mean, I can just imagine the state of Sarah alayhi salam. And she said, okay, that's Allah's will. It's okay, it's okay. Khalas, Allah didn't want to give me the children. He, want, he promised Ibrahim, he didn't promise me. That's okay, it seems I'm not. And she swallowed it. So Allah Azza wa Jal came back and rewarded her double of what he rewarded Hajar. He said, not only are you going to see your child, you're going to see your grandchild. فَبَشَّرْنَاهُ بِإِسْحَاقَ وَمِنْ وَرَاءِ إِسْحَاقِ يَعْقُوبِ Sarah got a double, two-generation Bishara. 
because truly for what she went through was unbelievable so Ibrahim alayhi salam gets Ismail after 80 and then they say Ishaq was born when he was 90 they say Sayyidina Ibrahim lived up to 172 years so he lived a long time so the idea do you feel that your children are a blessing are you thankful that Allah gave you children do, do you thank Allah for that this prophets and messengers that we hold in the highest place we were crying to Allah please ya Allah give me a child please Imran and his wife they are Imran is 93 his wife is 83 please ya Allah give us a child and then Allah gives him a child people talk about the miraculous birth of Jesus right does anyone talk about the miraculous birth of Mary She was born to old parents, 93 and 83, and she was like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Her father died while she was in her mother's womb. Her mother died at age four to six. She went and moved to her Zakaria uncle, her Khala's house, and, and, and stayed there and grew up there. Subhanallah. So the idea here is having Maryam at an old age, having Zak Yahya at an old age, having, having a, Ismail at an old age, having Ishaq at an old age. And these are amazing stories that we need to appreciate. And I do see, I do see parents make the mistake. Why did I mention this point? Don't do the opposite. Parents say to their kids, you are a burden on me. You're making my life miserable. Since I had you, my life went south and miserable. And this, you know, when your kids drive you crazy so much, and you start blaming them for existing. <laughs> don't do that. Don't, don't, don't make your child believe that they are a burden on you. You say, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. If anything, let your child remember that you used to say to them, you know, I think you're Allah's greatest gift to me. Imagine if that's what they remember. They will forget everything you taught them <laughs> and they will remember this when you die. And because of this, anything right now you say is comes beautiful. If your child genuinely feels that you appreciate them, that you are happy that they exist, that they, you, you know, and, and this is when we parents are stressed out. So we don't have time to express our positive emotions. We are constantly, what did you not do today? Can you look at what they did, right, and express some appreciation? Can you say you are Allah's biggest gift to me? Can you say, wow, you, you actually cleaned your room after so many days of not... Jazakallahu khairan, you made me happy. Uh, you are, you know that you are a positive presence in my life. I, I love you, you are Allah's ni'mah to me. If you say that, why is this crucial and why am I starting with this? Talk like that to your child, and if you tell your child jump, after that they will ask you how high. Talk with negativity, talk with your burdening me, talk your source of my stress, especially when they are in their formative years, and they will never want to listen to you for the rest of your life. So first mind frame, having children is a big deal. It's really a big deal. Like it's a big gift, big ni'mah. And express that to your children. You are a ni'mah in my life, not a ni'mah. You are a ni'mah in my life, not a ni'mah. Subhanallah. The second mind frame that I want you to, uh, this, that this idea, I was reflecting, okay, this idea that a husband and wife and children. This is the divine plan for mankind. You know how bacteria multiplies? What's the word in English? In English, who knows? How does my bacteria multiply? Are you a doctor or not? Are you a doctor? Dentist? You look like a dentist. Right? Allah, be a dentist today. What's the name when the bacteria splits in half? There is a word for that. In Arabic, it's a word for the word. Huh? Ah, something like that. I what? 
may produce? Not reproduce, I'm not talking about reproducing through splitting. Mutation? No, that mutation is when the. There is a word in English. Meiosis? Mitosis? Can someone read? What is mitosis? Is that the word that I'm looking for? Mitosis. So, do you think the only way to multiply, if the goal of, ha of, of you know, getting married is to have children, do you know Allah could have just like you're walking, then you go to sleep, then your upper half will grow feet, and your lower half will grow a head, and then you wake up two people. Easy. It's happening 24-7 to trillions of bacteria. You know, in a human body, the average human adult body has 30 to 37 trillion cells. The number of bacteria is minimum. Multiply that number times three. For every one cell, there is three bacteria, if not more. And then you are born with, and you have on average around one million viruses running through your body. And they don't kill you. Not all viruses kill you. Some viruses are actually part of our digestive system and body. So my issue to you is this plan that Allah said, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ One of Allah's ayat. أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجَ That He created for you mates from amongst yourself. And for the man there is a woman, for the woman there is a man. Why? لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً So you feel tranquility. And Allah put between you affection, يعني love and mercy. Truly in that are signs for those who reflect. إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ who made this design that the only way we come to life is through two parents meeting? Who, who made that? Allah. So the family design was, do, do you know that Allah created first Adam? You all know that, right? There was no Hawa. Humanity survived for God knows, long, God knows how long as one person, one individual. Adam had in him Adam and Hawa. Then from Adam's rib, Allah created Another, same species, different gender. And Allah Azza wa Jal told Adam, this is my blessings on you. So you have someone to talk to, someone you feel. So the very interesting thing, and this is important, and important for raising children, because we still have in our cultures that we prefer boys over girls or something like that. And then men in general talk about women and trash. You know, talk them like bad words. And, and, and then women talk about men. Okay, it's unbelievable how Allah solved this problem and pulled discrimination against races and discrimination between men and women from its roots. He pulled it from the roots. What did Allah say? First ayah in Surah An-Nisa, Ya ayyuhan nasu, inna khalaqnakum, Ya ayyuhan nasu, taqu rabbakum, الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة. All mankind, all mankind, be mindful of your Lord who created you from a single soul. وخلق منها زوجها. From that soul he created its pair. And from these two pairs وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء. So do you know that the first multiplying happened on planet Earth was through mitosis? Because from Adam Allah took Eve. So there wasn't a birth. There was like a splitting two bodies from each other. Then Allah could have created, continued with the same Eve broken to half, and now we have two Eves, and Adam broken to half, two Adams. But Allah did not do that. So Allah said, This one soul, we're going to split it into half. We're going to call this male, we're going to call this female. Tayyib. So how do we move forward? Allah Azza wa Jalla said, Just like one soul brought two, these two are going to bring again one soul. What is having a child? What is you and me? What, what are we? One cell, 23 chromosomes from mom, 23 chromosomes from dad. Literally every cell in your body, half of it is from your mom, half of it from your dad. One soul became two, the two became one. The one becomes two, the two becomes one. That's what we, that it keeps on happening again and again and again. Adam and Eve were one soul. Nafsin wahida. Wa khalaqa minha zawjaha. Wa batha minhuma rijalan kathira wa nisa. 
through them so many men and women. Every time a man and woman come together as a husband and wife and they have a child, the two became one. So what are you? You're walking around, literally, you are your mom and dad walking around together. <laughs> That's who we are. That's ajeeb. <laughs> That's insane. Like you, when you think of it, oh my God, half of me is my mom. Oh my God, and half of me is my dad. Oh, so I'm carrying both of them while I'm walking around? That's insane. That's beautiful. So the, the concept, the frame that you need to think is that, that to have a family is a divine plan. To have a wife, to have a husband is a divine plan. So Allah planned for us to have a husband and wife and he told us for so many reasons. Tranquility, love, mercy, partnership, friendship, uh, 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 support, splitting the responsibilities, uh, and then having a one soul again, children. And then together, instead of one parent raising a child, two parents raising a child together, so, you know, responsibility. And then these two parents, Allah give them a, a gift. What is the gift? So, you know, I see every time Allah grants me a son, Allah has just handed me another Adam. Here is your Adam. Take. When Allah grants me daughter, Allah granted me Hawa. Here is your Hawa. So I'm, I'm looking and saying, Allah, uh, what do I do with that? So Allah says, uh, go and read the Quran. What did I do with Adam and Hawa? Do like me. What did Allah do with Adam and Hawa? Two things Allah did for Adam and Hawa. And these are two mindsets frame. First, he created for them a place to live in that doesn't ruin the fitra that he puts in them. So Allah put in Adam and Hawa, the fitra, in you and I, the fitra. Allah put them an environment in an environment that doesn't ruin their fitra. So he created for them the garden and they lived in that garden. I assume you know that 60% of Muslim scholars think that the garden, the Jannah that Adam entered, it's the Jannah of Al-Akhirah. 40% of Muslim mufassirin and scholars interpret the word Jannah like Allah uses the word Jannah in the Quran, meaning a garden with fruits, which means Allah put them on earth in a garden. So when he said Jannah here, he's not talking about the Jannah of Al-Akhirah, he's talking about a garden on earth. I actually adopt that opinion, but the other opinion is also correct. Whether it's the Jannah of Al-Akhir or Jannah Dunya. Because to, like, uh, the objection is, in Jannah of Al-Akhir there is no haram. So how is there a tree that you cannot eat? In Jannah of Al-Akhir, Iblis, Allah cursed him. He became Rajim. And the meaning of Rajim, he cannot enter Jannah. So how did Iblis enter Jannah to tell Adam and Eve eat from the tree? And in Jannah of Akhirah, if you enter it, you cannot leave it. So how come Adam and Eve left? Yani, so, so many reasons. So what did Allah do? We want to learn from Allah. What did Allah do with Adam and Eve so that we can copy? He created from them a Jannah, a garden. Look where Allah connected them with nature. Connect your kids to nature. That's why I tell them, tell you, make your kids watch nature documentaries. Number one. Number two. Take your kids, make it a family tradition to go and take your kids to natural places. In California, we have the mother of all natural places. And then travel the world, not for tourism. No, we want to connect with Allah. Let's go and visit the Muslims. Let's go to Malaysia, visit the Muslims in Malaysia, and go to the jungle in Malaysia. Raise your kids connected to nature. Because when Allah created Adam and Eve, where did he put them? Fil Jannah, in the middle of the forest, in the middle of the jungle, in the middle of a fruit, garden and he said in you know فَكُلَا مِنْهَا رَغَدًا حَيْثُ شِئْتُمَا eat from it as much وَلَا تَقْرَبَا هَذِهِ الشَّجَرَةِ don't eat eat from this tree طيب. so I have good news for you this is a mindset that should relax you when we have children suddenly an idea takes over the mind of the parents what's the idea oh, i have to teach my child everything oh my god i have to teach him this and this, and this. Shh, shh, shh. relax your child comes with a fitra built in your first job as a parent is to actually protect that fitra you don't even have to teach nothing relax first six years apply for vacation 
Because your kid is coming with fitrah. So your first task is to protect that fitrah because your child between age one, what, cannot speak. End of age one, they say, Baba, Mama, age two, they can't stop talking now, right? And you're like, Rrr. and already, mashallah, the Americans identified the, the age two is already terrible twos. Yeah, he, what did you leave for 20? If he's terrible at two, at 20, what is criminal, serial killer? Yani terrible two, haram alik. Take it easy. If terrible two, terrible three, terrible four, uh, what are we going to leave for terrible 12 and 13 and 14 and 15? Yani this is, they're not terrible. They just learn how to speak and, and they learn because you discover your willpower at age two that you can actually say no. So do you know why two years old keep on saying no? They're so happy. It's like they tasted sugar for the first time. Oh my God, I can taste sugar. Oh, I can say no. Oh, let me see what happens when I say no. And then you go crazy. So they love it more. So now they say more to you. No, <laughs> to you. You should not respond. You're, they say no. You're like, ha, ha, ha. You're funny. Khalas, they're not going to say no again. Because they, the, they didn't get the sugar back. Oh my God, every time I say no, something happens in this house. Everybody pays attention to me. Let me say no more. He doesn't even know what no means. He only knows that when he says no, he gets your attention. So relax. So what's the first job? Mind frame. Allah grants you a child. Number one task. Protect their fitrah. Put them in the garden. Let them connect with Allah's nature. Check your house. Check the walls. MashaAllah, you looked very pretty the night you got married. Can you please take the pictures down from the wall? Put them in the album and put some قُلْ وَاللَّهُ أَحَدْ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقُ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْنَّاسِ On the wall so that your child grows up with the ayat of the Quran printed in his head. Build the environment at home that will, your child will become naturally a Muslim. Your child from the day they were born, everything every day on the TV, it plays Quran. And when I say TV here, I don't mean like channels and flipping channels. I mean like you connected your YouTube to your TV. So put adh Quran, then Adhkaru Sabah. Then when you're driving your kids to the school, run Adhkaru Sabah. You know, it's in the Adhkar, A-T-H-K-A-R. And YouTube will finish it for you. Adhkar Sabah and will give you Mshari bin Rashid Al-Afasi and so many other people who have Adhkar Sabah. Listen to it and repeat it in the morning. What is running in your house? What is the environment that is going to nurture and feed your child? Subhanallah, one of the things that children do and parents misinterpret is when your child is a baby actually and they hear the Quran or the Adhan, they start crying. And your parent freaking out. The only thing that children know how to express their emotions is crying. Your children, when they want to laugh as infant, they cry. And the reason why they cry, because for the first time in this world, they hear what they used to hear in the world of souls. Adhan, Quran, Dhikrullah, Malaika. So when they hear it, they start crying. Crying is a good sign when your child is an infant and they hear the Quran and they are crying. Don't freak out. It's a good sign. Oh my God, I picked a child and I started, you know, some children, they go silent, mashallah. But sometimes you make adhan, you know, adhan in the right ear, in the qam on the left ear, and your kid is crying and you're freaking out. Shaitan, no, 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 there's no shaitan. That's him expressing his happiness. You're reminding him of the world that he just came from. You understand? And, and then colicky kids that are crying, crying, crying. These colicky kids, there is a study that they turn out to be the smartest kids out there. So yani, you suffer a year or two, but then you're taking pride. Oh, my kid is all A's, you know, but he was a Kaliki baby, right? So the idea is our first task is what? Is to protect the fitrah. Your child comes Islam built in. So don't stress out. Then now your first job is to protect the fitrah. Then the second job is to what? Is now to teach. Yani, Repeat after me Surah Al-Fatiha. And I'm teaching Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, La ilaha illallah, MashaAllah, Subhanallah, Subhanallah, Rabbi Al-Azim, Subhanallah, Rabbi Al-A'la. The second thing, first protect the, the nature of the child. Second, start teaching them indirectly, not with stress. Especially between age 1 and 12. When they are not mukallaf yet. They are not responsible. Make it fun, make it songs, make it this. And put them in the garden, which is nature. Connect them with Allah's nature. Don't give them so much uh, 
electronics when they're kids because they're gonna connect with the electronics and they're not gonna know how to connect with Allah's nature. Allah put Adam and Eve fil Jannah, yani in this garden full of fruits. So the idea here is that's another mind frame. If you take that, parenting will become relaxing. When does the nafs kick in? When puberty kicks in. That's when the nafs of an adult kicks in the child. Before the puberty kicks in, your child have a nafs of a child. They're still functioning, running on fitra. Right? So you protect the fitra, number one. You start teaching indirectly through the Quran in the morning and the Quran on the walls and the coming and going to the masjid, coming and going to the masjid, bringing them. You are planting the seeds and they are recording, 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 recording. Finally, by the age 10, 12, 6, 8 or 10, they stop recording and they're going to start playing. And that's why I say if you have invested in your child between age 1 and 6, 1 and 8, 1 and 10, I have a good news for you and I, I have numbers too. Even if your kid goes crazy a little bit as a teenager or young ad adults, ad ad adolescent, your kid will come back to Islam. Why? Because the first formative years got recorded, he cannot change himself even if he wanted to. The only thing that overrides this is when a person becomes a Muslim. And if they were grown up of Allah's mercy, do you know why Islam overrides the formative years in a non-Muslim who becomes Muslim? Do you know why? Because it matches the fitrah he was born with. So it becomes Islam over fitrah, it wipes out the formative years. Otherwise, no one can convert to Islam. No one can say, I, khalas, I was born non-Muslim, I'm going to be... No, 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 no. Islam is the religion of the fitrah. When you become Muslim, your fitrah meets Islam. All the formative year garbage or damage or trash that came into your life, it will all be erased. So that's how the Sahaba, they were all non-Muslims and they all became Muslim. Subhanallah. So that's the beauty where the fitrah meets Islam because it's the religion of the fitrah. Now imagine your kid is born Muslim in a Muslim family, give them. So I see parents don't pay attention to this. One, Quran running on TV. Two, Quran running in the car. Three, nasheed, you know, sallallahu ala muhammadan, mawla ya salli wa salli qamarun. Once these are planted, you know, when I turn on these songs for children, my kids in the back start singing uncontrollably. I don't even ask them to sing. We all are so focused on, I am going to teach you now. Sit down and listen. That doesn't work. That's called direct information. Direct education doesn't work. Indirect, fun, happiness, prayer on me. Let's go to the masjid. Friday, ice cream day. So what do they associate Salat al-Jum'ah? After Salat al-Jum'ah, there is ice cream. Best day of the week. <laughs> They're going to grow up and know that it's the best day of the week for other reasons. But now, for ice cream, it's okay. It's a child. You know Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Turjuman al-Quran. Do you know what Aisha radiallahu anha said? He was memorizing the Quran as a young age. The men are praying taraweeh and tahajjud. So sometimes the wives of the Prophet and, and the women of the believer, Ansar, Muhajirin, they want to have their own uh, qiyam. So guess how they get Abdullah ibn Abbas? Come, 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 lead salah. And then he said, radiallahu anhu, and they used to give me bread with sugar after that. <laughs> donuts, donuts. <laughs> bread with honey. Bread with honey. So he used to come and say, okay, I'll lead tarawih as long as there is a plate with honey. Then he became Turjuman al-Quran, Hibru al-Ummah, the, the scholar of the Ummah, Abdullah ibn Abbas. What are you doing at home to make Islam exciting and to make your morals, manners, ethic exciting? What, be creative, right? We're good, with, uh, we're good with dessert, we're good with food, we're good with... What are you doing to associate the sugary taste with Islam? The, the best food with the Quran. Uh, the celebration, you know, like Imam al Nawawi, he said, We know that the Sahaba did not celebrate the birth of the Prophet. But absolutely, there is no harm in a man bringing his family together 
and re review the seerah of the Prophet, then they eat dinner and they eat sweets. This is Imam al Nawawi, the one who explains Sahih Muslim. So the idea here is are we, are we creative? Subhanallah. The birthday comes, we put the cake. So the cake is associated with, with a Western habit. The Prophet ﷺ on his birthday used to fast. We, on our first day, we get a heart attack and stroke from how much we eat. It's completely the opposite thing. So do you teach your kid, if you want to celebrate their birthday, tell them on your birthday, you're going to fast. Thankfulness to Allah. And at the end of the day, on your iftar, we're going to sing and say Alhamdulillah and you're going to tell us how many surahs you memorized this uh, this year yeah we're going to make the cake not because you were born what, what value like you were born you're not Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we're not going to fast on your birthday but we're going to fast on Monday but what are you presenting so kiss your kid grows up associating cakes with western that's pointless and meaningless you associate now the cake with the milad of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Ice cream with Salat al-Jum'ah. Donuts with after Hifz school. Use these things because it will make your kid absolutely love Islam and you don't have to worry about it for the rest of your life. So this is something that is very, uh, very important when it comes to uh, uh, mindset and frame. Preserve the fitra number one and number two, uh, teach Islam and associate it for a child with with that which is uh, with the deen, you know, the pleasure uh, with the deen. Allah Azza wa Jal designed that we get married and Allah designed that we will have children and when we have a child, we're having a new Adam or a new Eve. So we go back and ask, what did Allah do with Adam and Eve? One, he put them in the garden, protecting their fitrah. Two, he taught them. وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا Education comes. That's why I'm big on education. I want your kids to be genius in math. But they're not going to be genius in math with 40 kids in the classroom. Take them to where five kids in the classroom with the homeschooling model. I want your kids to be genius in science. How? You make tahbib, you, know, you make them love it. Because Allah said, وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ Kullaha, all the names. And literally, literally, like sometimes you read when you're young, you don't get it. But because language is was the power of Adam alayhi salam. So Allah told Adam, this is the sun. It rises, it sits, it gives heat, it gives light. It does, this is the benefit, it gives life to the plants. So he learned science. This is the moon. The moon is essential for the earth. It brings you the four seasons. It tilts the earth. It does this. It gives you light at night. It's connected. The tide of the oceans is connected to the moon. The, oh, Adam had knowledge now. So when Adam was done learning all of the sciences, because Allah said he taught him the names of all the things, because Adam had no father or mother to teach him language. So Allah taught him language. And with the language, he taught him the meanings of the things. So he has to teach him al-asma, the names of the things. What's the first thing you learn as a child? Baba. Mama, Kursi, Paula, Kasa, Ma, you know, whatever language you have that you're spending. What is the first thing we learn? The names of all the things. Then we dive into why is this like that? Why is the sun? What does the sun benefit me? So what do we learn from Allah's subhanahu wa ta'ala model? Number one, put them in a safe environment, connect them with nature, protect their fitra. Number two, teach them. And when you teach them, don't separate in your brain between Islamic education and science education. They're all Islamic. They're all one. They all come from Allah Azza wa That's why we are the one who led the world in sciences. And the world picked from us and continued. And we stayed behind. One of the, you know, it's like a joke. They say, uh, Imam al-Khawarizmi. Who, uh, who took the in Indian numerals, turned them into Arabic numerals, and, and, and the way of calculation was better than the Roman numerals, because with the Roman you have to calculate letters instead of numbers. And then his invention is he created number zero. No one in the history of mankind thought that we can give a value to nothing. 
There was no such a thing. Okay, you start with one. Well, you, you, you're going to have a number and the value of number is nothing? Are you crazy? That's what Imam Al-Khawariz al needed. So, I heard my sheikh said, unfortunately, we invented zero and then we sat there at zero. <laughs> so, inshallah, we want to go beyond uh, zero, inshallah, Rabbil Alameen. So, the idea here, وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا Teach them all the sciences from an Islamic perspective connected with their deen and iman and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then, um, and then that's another mindset. The third thing is Allah gave clear, unambiguous uh, instruction to Adam. Do not eat from the tree. So we have to teach our kids, do this and don't do that. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. MashaAllah. Do this and do not do that. We have to teach our kids, do this and do not do that. وَلَا تَقْرَبَ هَذِهِ الشَّجَرَةِ فَتَكُونَ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ Action, consequence. You eat from the tree, you become from a dhalimi. You don't eat from the tree, you're fine. The ambiguity sometimes that we give to our children, can you do it or not do it? It kills the child. The children don't know how to process ambiguity and confusion. So you need to what? We need to define and we need to tell our children, okay, we don't do this. So your child will ask, why we don't do it? Then we have to be ready. If haram, everything haram is harmful. As a matter of fact, I think the word harm in English came from the word haram in Arabic. Like if you try to say haram and you can't pronounce the ha, what are you going to say? Haram. That's harm to me. So anything that is harmful is haramful. Okay? So haram is what is harm. Teach your kid that all the time. Not we don't do it just because we don't do it because we don't do it. No, we don't do it because it's harmful. Number two, anything that is haram is addictive. Subhanallah. Allah said alcohol is addictive. Do you know what is equally addictive? And some scientists say it's more addictive. Gambling, very addictive. Another one that Allah predicted ahead of science that it is addictive is sleeping around. وَلَا تَقْرَبُ الزِّنَا إِنَّهُ كَانَ فَحِشَةً وَسَاءَ سَبِيلًا It becomes a sabil. It becomes a way of life. يعني it becomes addictive. So now they have places where they heal people that are used to sleep with a different person every night or every week. They don't know how to restrict themselves to one person. So they need therapy. And now there is a healing from na'udhu billah, the thing that is attacking all of our men and women and children, uh, which is the stuff on the phones, which is pornography. So it is addictive. So what happens to haram? Haram will always enslave you. How? Through addiction. We Muslims are the slaves of who? Allah. Who's Allah? Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. We're the servants and the slaves of Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Al-Khamr has no rahma in it. Gambling has no rahma in it. Zina has no rahma in it. Stealing, do you know stealing is addictive? Cheating and stealing, easy access to money. Why do I'm going to go and work for a whole month or a whole week to be paid $1,000 after they deduct my taxes when I actually can go and steal it? Stealing is addictive. Imam Ibn Sina, one of, when he established the mental health in his, uh, in his Maristan, uh, he had a mental health, so they brought for him a, a thief. The thief, he ran, he stole, jumped like a, over a fence, and then fell, broke his knee, yani his leg. So he put him, he realized, he said, what happened? He said, oh, I got caught stealing, but khalas, I repented. So Imam Ibn Sina knows that Allah will not expose a person when he commits haram the first time. He realized this guy is addicted. He asked the policeman, he said, we always catch him. So he said, okay, we, uh, you, you hurt your leg so much, we're going to amputate it. He made ilaj nafsi. The guy is now going crazy. Oh my God, my sins caught up to me. He's crying. And he says, I don't know, but you need a miracle. You need to pray to Allah and repent so hard. Maybe, maybe I will not cut your leg. 
and he left him like that for a week. He made a tawbah 10,000 times a day. After that, he told him, oh, alhamdulillah, we're not going to amputate your legs and this and that. He did mental treatment for his addiction to stealing. Look, look at how smart our doctors were. So you need to explain to your children. When Allah said, وَلَا تَقْرَبَ هَذِهِ الشَّجْرَةِ And he explained to them why. Haram is harmful. Haram is addictive. Number three, always haram is expensive. Subhanallah. Alcohol and liquor, expensive. Gambling, expensive. Drugs, expensive. Haram relationship, they go to the clubs and God knows what, expensive. Anything that is haram is extremely expensive. Because it's desired, it's hot in the market, it becomes expensive. Number five, anything that is haram, what is common between all of them, is it breaks relationships. Zina destroys the relationship between a husband and wife. Stealing destroys the relationship between a worker and his boss, or two, you can steal from your brother, from your sister, from your neighbor, from this. It destroys the relationship. Gambling, when you gamble and the other person wins and you lose, if that person you know them, you destroy the relationship, you took all of my money. Stealing destroys the relationship. Zina destroys the relationship. Uh, khamr destroys the relationship. The alcohol. You drink. You know, you know, you know, uh, I, you have to know this, which you already know, I'm sure. 1920, in the late uh, 19, uh, you know, 1918, uh, and to 1920 was the first time women were allowed to vote in the United States. What's the first accomplishment of the women lobby in the United States? Prohibition. The prohibition. Do you know who asked for alcohol to be prohibited? The women of the United States of America. Do you know why? Because they were sick and tired of their husbands going and drinking and coming home and beating them. The first accomplishment of the women lobby and the feminist movement in America was to declare Khamar Haram. And they tried for four to six years. It cost the US government $236 million. And at that time, that sounds like $236 billion. And they couldn't do it because it's not made out of Iman. Finally, they let it go. What does Khamar do? Destroys the relationship. The proof was the woman, as, as they said, we're sick and tired of our husband beating us and beating their children after coming home from drinking. So do you see what's common between haram? You need to explain that to your children. And that is number, what are we, number five, number six, number one, every haram it is harmful. Number two, addictive. Number three, expensive. Number four, it breaks relationships. Number five, everything that is haram, um, subhanallah, I just forgot it, but that's okay. So I'll come back to it. So what is haram in the Quran is it's, it's very uh, 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 destructive and it destroys the relationship also between you and the most important one that relates to you which is Allah Rabbil Alameen right? and number six it destroys the relationship between you and you do you think someone who's addicted to alcohol respects himself? Fitra, fitra you think someone who's addicted to stealing respects himself well thinks highly of himself do you think someone who wasted his money and wasted his life and his body and he respects himself. So it doesn't only destroy the relationship between others, it destroys the relationship between you and you, it destroys the relationship between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And number seven, practicing haram in dunya makes you go to hell in dunya because your life becomes hell. We have to explain these things. Uh, Number, yeah, when I said فَتَكُونَ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ Oppression. Going overboard. When someone drinks, they never stop drinking or one glass. It becomes two, three, four, five, six. You go overboard. طُغْيَانَ الظُّلْمِ When you drink, you go and beat your wife and beat your children 
and kill somebody who was just crossing the streets, drunk driving. What is that called? A zulum. When you waste all of the money and the money of your wife and children and the money of the rent and the money of the grocery on gambling, what did you do? Zulum. Oppression, aggression against yourself, your family and the society. Eight reasons so far why haram is haram. So if we don't understand that and we don't explain and especially right now in America let's think together what's haunting our children in America in the world of amal the same thing drugs which is tucked under alcohol drugs alcohol physical relationships right gambling uh, not many people gamble but it's also part now they're opening gamblings even to sports and everything it's all in the haram stealing gangs related you know how can you lose your child in America in the world of actions these are the things. Not only Muslims lose their children, even non-Muslims, if their children get into this, they lose them. It's a, it's a process of loss. طيب. So if, if this happens, haram ends up making the children, you know, you need to explain that. The second fear on your children, one is in the world of a'mal and the other one is in the world of iman and i'tiqad. What's the threat to your children? Disbelief in Allah. So you need to talk about Allah, to, about Allah and teach them in a logical way. When they ask you a question, you don't know the answer, don't be upset. Who created Allah? This is the most common question. You need to know how to answer that question. Don't be upset that your child said that. If, you, if, if your child comes in, oh, big question, and they ask you and you're like, huh, easy. Versus, shut up. What are you doing? Haram. Or, oh my God, I don't know what's the answer. That Don't portray non-confidence and don't portray anger when someone has a doubt. When someone has a doubt, there is an answer. You don't know the answer. Call the sheikh, call the masjid, call somewhere. Make a research. How do I answer that question? So the threat to our children, if we are to identify, is that in the side of belief, uh, why do we need a religion? That needs an answer. That needs an answer. I have an answer for that. And I use the answer with the top atheists that they come, they want to embrace Islam, or agnostic. I believe in God, but what this business of religion? So what are you, mister? I am spiritual, but not religious. MashaAllah. Let's apply. Let's see where you apply that. Bismillah. So the last time you were driving in the highway, you were logging 80 over 65. So the police stops you. Sir, do you know why I stopped you? Uh, maybe uh, you were speeding. You were putting 80 over 65. Oh, excuse me, officer. I'm spiritual. I'm not religious. I don't believe in tickets. I mean, you can write me your phone number and email, but you know, I don't. You go to work. Why you are showing up eight? 9, 10, 1 p.m. Why you're not meeting your deadlines? Oh, boss, I know you like this, but I have something to share. I'm spiritual. I don't believe in rules. Do you apply that? In university, oh, professor, I know you have a syllabus and deadlines, but I just want to share something about myself. I'm spiritual. I'm not religious. You go to the court, your honor, I know I need a ticket and this, but I have something to share with you. I'm spiritual, I'm not religious. Where do you use this, I'm spiritual, I'm not religious? Where else in your life do you use it? Only when it comes to God. It's the funniest thing. So that's why this argument, you need to know how to argue, the arguments at the time, doubt in Allah, doubt in having religion. Why do we need to follow our role model, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? My child asked me that. Like, why do we need? I know we should love Rasulullah. I know the, but we don't know him and he's not living with us. How can we take him as a role model? Very legitimate question. That was a turning point in his life when I answered that question. Say, what do you like to play? Basketball. Why? I don't know. I tell him, I know why you like basketball. Because you saw someone playing basketball. If you've never seen someone playing basketball, would you love basketball? He said, no. I said, that's why we need Prophet Muhammad وسلم, who is a role model because the power of role model in our lives is everywhere. And I'm going to stop there because the Adhan and Salat al-Isha. 
So we did one question and answer from 6 to 7. We started around 7 to 8, Salat al-Isha. And inshallah, the second hour of presentation is after to 9 because I heard that you pick up your children here at 9. So inshallah, we will continue with the next mindset and frame before we deal with dynamics and actual, uh, you know, do's and don'ts uh, of parenting tomorrow, inshallah. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Uh, alhamdulillah, we will continue with the shifting the mindset and the perspective about parenting to more of a Quranic and prophetic uh, parenting and understanding. Um, one mindset and, and mind frame um, is that the, the, the issue is if you fail to plan the goals. Uh, one of the things I, I find ruins the relationship between parents and their children and makes the children grow up confused between do we listen to Allah always or sometimes we listen to Allah and sometimes we listen to you if the two commands contradict one another. <sighs> Obviously, theoretically, we always listen to Allah. But parents sometimes cannot handle that. Because sometimes what Allah says is not what they want. And maybe they have a good legitimate concern. And that's when you go and speak to a scholar, an imam, that explain things to you. One thing you want to define, define in your home who is the highest authority. And it has to be clear in the minds of your children that number one, the highest authority in the house is Allah Jalla Jalalu and His Word, Al Quran Al Kareem. And in the world of human beings, the highest moral and the highest ethical and the highest religious authority is Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and His Sunnah. If there is something that is in the Quran and in the Sunnah, we all have to listen to it, you and I. Define that highest moral authority. Let your kid grow up saying, oh my God, my, my father and my mother, they will argue with me this and this and that. But if Allah's word is there or the Prophet Wasallam, they always will follow. So that gives leading by example, your children, when you tell them, but Allah said that, when they see you abiding by that and they see you're abiding by the laws of Allah and the boundaries of Allah, they cannot argue with you because you're implementing it on yourself. So who's the highest authority in the house? This is where we fail, I feel, as Muslim parents. We become in our head so much that I am the highest authority in the house. I'm the highest uh, requirement in the house. Yeah, the, the light one. Yes, Jazakumullah khair, this one. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm the highest authority in the house. You listen to me. Your whole life, what are you telling your child? You listen to me. You obey me. I am the father. I'm the mother. My rules, my house, the rules under this roof you follow. 16, 17, 18 years, your child never heard you saying, we listen to Allah in this house. We listen to his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa The highest authority is Allah and his messenger. Allah is the boss. We listen to him. We submit to him. We obey him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. We, he gave us a role model. We follow that role model. That's who's boss in this house. What happens if you say Allah is the boss? The relationship between you and your kid will be a very nice relationship because you're not trying to boss him around. You are right now both Ibadullah. You're both the servants of Allah. But I, you grow up in a household, Muslim household, and the child never heard in his 18 years that Allah is the highest word and this. Second mindset that is immediately linked to this mindset is that I don't know how we get worked out as parents, like we get so much worked out that I am the power, I'm the authority, I'm the and you have to listen to me. And you think we, we kind of in our head subconsciously, I know we don't do that consciously, like I have a different set of rules. 
that different than your set of rules. Do you know what's so beautiful about Islam? The same rules the child has to follow are the same rules the father has to follow. There is no two Islam, one for the father and mother and one for the child and the son and the daughter. Yet we make it sound like that. Show me one thing haram for the child but not haram for the parents. Show me one thing halal for the, for the parents but not halal for the child. Show me one fard in Islam that is fard for the children but not fard for the parents. No, there is nothing. It's only one thing and that one thing, that card, we should not pull it in every conversation until it's no more a card. Like the card gets used so much, the card becomes old. You can't even pull it, you know, like a red card because you used it so much, the card f fell apart. Which is, the only difference in a, in a relationship is actually that your kids should listen to you and you're not bounded by you should listen to them. Unless what they're telling you to do is the correct thing, again, in the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet You're doing something wrong, your child tells you. If you tell your child, no, you think you're gonna teach me my deen? I know the Islam before you were born. I was worshiping Allah, who do you think you are? You just destroyed the relationship for life. He was trying to advise you, trying to hold you and to hold your feet to the same standard that you were trying to hold his feet to. But when it came to you being held, your kibr and ghurur and arrogance and me, my, myself, I'm a father, I'm the mother, how dare you tell me to hold me? No. If your child one day comes and says, but Allah says that in the Quran, you should say, okay, if what you're saying is right and your interpretation is right, then it will be the happiest moment in my life that my son and daughter corrected me and brought me back to Asirat al mustaqim That means you did your job very well. You raised a good kid. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, and I am far, 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 and I mean that from being a perfect parent, but one thing I did is this with my children. They can hold my feet to the fire. Like Allah said that, I say, okay, let's sit down, see what Allah said, Look at your interpretation because you're interpreting right now. If your interpretation are good and valid and what is the consensus of the Muslim scholars, I'll follow it. And, and I will be very happy to follow it. And I will be very proud of you that you corrected me. They advise one another to stick to the truth one another. But in our mind, some way, somehow, because there is one thing in Islam, which is true, that the child, I mean, naturally, the child has to listen to the father and mother in the umur of deen and dunya. The father and the mother don't have to listen to the child in the umur of the dunya. But if the child was right in the umur of the deen, in the matters of the deen, then the parents have to listen to the child. Because there is not a different Islam for the father and mother versus the son and daughter. It's the same Islam. So why don't you take advantage of that? And take yourself away from being the unlike, disliked authority. You, 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 you don't have to say, you listen to me. No, no, you say, you know, alhamdulillah, I know you want to do that. But you know what, my dear daughter, I cannot do that, you cannot do that. Because we're Muslims and we listen to Allah. So this is not me putting the rules on you. This is Allah putting the rules on all of us. And we say, سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا And let me explain to you the hikmah behind why Allah told us to do this. Or the hikmah, and which means the wisdom behind why Allah told us not to do that. I just shared with you right off bat without like really going to the deep, the eight reasons why, like eight... Uh, logical, wise reason why haram is haram in Islam. Share that with your child. Let them have some rationale, some Islamic way of thinking. Oh, when I am about to do something, I first check, is it halal or haram? And if it is halal, I check, is it makruh or halal? And it, like, teach them a way of thinking. Teach them a way of processing information. So two things, get yourself out of the way, make Allah the highest authority in the house. Why? Two things are going to happen. Number one, your child will leave home and they're not going to be under your authority. So if you did not plant in their heart that Allah is the highest authority, they will be the day that they leave hell and go to heaven, the day they leave your house. I can do whatever I want right now. No. You should have planted Allah's consciousness. Allah is watching you. 
Because at home, I was not hiding from mom and dad. We were all abiding by Allah Azza wa Jal. Even my mom and dad held themselves to the same standard that they held me to. So number one, your child is going to leave your home, either by means of studying or by means of getting married. Uh, we all raise our children, hoping one day they're going to How in the world they're going to grow up with consciousness if every time you taught them anything, it was me, I, I'm the boss, I'm telling you what to do. Never you connected them between them and Allah and made Allah the highest power and authority in their lives. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Number two, if you don't leave, you're going to die. And when you're going to die, they're going to live after you. What are they going to live with? Baba died. Okay, now who's the authority? This is a problem. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave us this long vision by saying, raise a child that will make dua for you after you die. So that the hasanat keeps on coming. Tayyip, you know, seriously, seriously. Would you make dua to someone that you don't love, that you don't like miss, that you don't, you know, subhanallah. So you want that relationship. And when you take yourself from always being, I mean, you, you should be the de facto power in the house. Like whatever Baba says, and this is another thing, the highest authority now, Allah Azza wa Jal, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam. And now Allah told us in the house that Allah in the design of the family said the father should be the authority. طيب. Unless the father is making the wrong call every time, every time, every time, which is mission impossible, like it's almost impossible that that. You, the mother, do not break the word of your husband in front of your child. Because right now you just broke the whole system. He's looking and getting clues from you. Okay, the highest authority that Allah said, the leader of the house is the man, not the dictator, but the leader of the house. As you said, sister, like when the father speaks to the kids, they listen immediately. You want that in their lives. It's okay, as they say, play it, bad cop, good cop. The father is the bad cop, I'm the khalas, that's okay. When they grow up, they're going to come to you as a friend, fine. But now, if, the, if, the, if the, the leader of the house, his word is constantly broken in front of the children, may Allah help you to what you're going to see from your children. Because they're not going to listen to the father, and now they show you, they, look, they are not going to listen to you, the mother. They're going to do whatever this. Because you broke the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let the man be the man. Subhanallah, the children, by, by design, they fear their father. They don't fear their mother. And that's good. Mother is the love. Mother is the this. Mother is that. Sometimes, exception, the mother is also tough. And, and, and the kids fear the mother and the father is very nice. It doesn't matter. If there is an authority in the house... And by the way, this goes both ways. Yani Allah put the leader. Let's say the mother said to the child, do not, I don't know, do not uh, use that juice. Do not drink that juice. Yani the father should be wise enough not to go against the mother in front of the children. So this goes both ways. Breaking the word of the father by the mother or breaking the word of the mother by the father. Complete destruction. If even if you know your husband is wrong or you know that your wife is wrong, you wait, let the child obey and then they go and then you discuss that I don't agree with this. Let's, can you please not say it again? And if she says, no, I will do it again. Why will you do it again? You, you go into a rational discussion. This rational discussion and you know the, the biggest spoiler of relationships, no matter what type of relationship, but especially husband and wife, is anger. Anger is constantly you're, you're making the other person angry or maybe the other person is angry themselves. Different families have different dynamics. Sometimes the person is angry themselves and it's not the problem of the spouse. And sometimes the spouse keeps on making, it's like self-fulfilled prophecy. I'm going to push you and push you and push you and push you until you become angry and then I'm going to say, you see, you're angry. Yeah, I mean, come on. In Arabic, there's a word called istighdab, making someone angry. Like, why? Why? So, that's why I said, remember in the beginning of the lecture, is that make sure that you are at peace at home. Because if you reach to a level that you're constantly breaking his word and he's breaking your word, then just separate. 
And I don't say that lightly. When people come to me and they, are, they have children, I try 1,001 ways to keep them together. So I don't talk about divorce. Oh, I just divorce easily, especially when there is children. If there's no children, it's a lot easier. But when there is children, you have to think 1,000 times. Show me you thought 1,000 times and it didn't work. Then I will tell you, okay, move on. So it's not a piece of cake. Or, uh, I see parents come to me and they say, oh, we're not meant for each other. It's better that the kids are raised without, a fa without this fighting every day. I say, no, it's better that they are raised with a father and the mother. Even if, it, you say, look, you are fighting with your husband. Hmm? And that has nothing to do with the children. No problem. Better not to fight in front of them. But what I'm talking about is fighting with the spouse about the children business. Okay, but mom and dad are fighting. After they're fighting, the mom and dad look at the children and say, listen, this is between us. This is just, that's okay. That, that, that's not between you. So that pa the children should not feel that they have to please one parent to make, uh, to make or, or to, if they please one parent, the other one be upset. No, 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 no. Because sometimes, you know, natural fights happen at home. As long as it's between you and your husband, business, no problem. But don't get the children involved in that uh, fight. And, and if you want to fight, go into the room outside, not in front of the kids. But definitely do not fight with each other and disagree with each other about something that one of the parents said to the child to do. That means you don't have your structure right. You don't have a Quranic home. Blame yourself for the way the kids you grow up. Allah, his messenger, the father, the mother. Father and mother, if their word matches Allah and his messenger, سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا If their word does not contradict Quran and Sunnah, سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا The only time the child is not bound to listen to his parents is when they go against the word of Allah. So this is another, these two mindsets may define the highest authority, number one. And number two, remember there is no two types of religion, one for the parents, one for the children. The only privilege you have is that your children should listen to you and you're not bound to listen to them. But you don't pull that card every day, every day. No, this you pull it once a year, you listen to me. I'm the parent, you listen to me. Right? And you say it one time. Don't say it because they're going to show weakness. The child is going to get, oh my God, I cannot listen and she cannot do anything and he cannot do anything. Don't act like helpless. You're not helpless. You have a lot of power and a lot of uh, a privilege. Yes, the final mindset that I will share with you is I see this common mistake and, 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 and I don't know what to call it, a, a missing of the right mindset. You can notice... You know, when I answer your questions, I talk about specifics. Um, if I'm not answering your question, I'm talking about general. What's most of the complaints that I get and all the therapists and children that are to get about children? What's the stress of the parents? The wrong stress. What is it? It's always about the short term. My child is not listening to me. Since when? Since yesterday. Seriously? Seriously? My child is not listening to me. Since when? Since a whole week. How many times in the week your child didn't listen to you? Oh, two times. Well, alhamdulillah, make dua. You have Yahya alayhi salam in your house. What is Only two times he disagreed with you and you're so f freaking out. What is happening here? Like you really have to... Uh, what I find with parenting that most of us parents were so consumed by today that we're not able to lift our head and look at tomorrow and look ahead and see that actually the work of parenting is not what's happening today and tomorrow or what a child started doing once in a while or developing a new habit. The problem is the long vision. What's going to happen? You have to think about what can I do today that will give me fruit after one year? Let me tell you why I hate the word raising. I shared that today in the khutbah because I find the word raising fits chicken and cattle. And we raise the chicken and the chicken are very nice and they're very beautiful birds, chicken. But there is another bird. Uh, by the way, who knows who... What, um, 
what's the smartest bird uh, on earth? Because all birds need their parents to feed them, you know, when they're born, the chick, you know, you feed, except uh, one bird. It's the smartest bird. It's born with full instincts. It knows how to eat, how to drink, doesn't need the parents. Huh? The raven, yes, al ghurab Actually, al ghurab cannot survive one day as a child without their parents feeding it. But it is the smartest bird, sahih. It's chicken. I kind of tricked you so that you don't know the answer. Do you know the only bird that doesn't need the parent to feed it is chicken? And do you know because it's very smart and very polite, it ended putting itself on the slaughter house. Do you know what we want our kids? We want our kids to be smart and obedient. Very good material to be slaughtered. Exactly like chicken. And cattle and camel. Like cattle are for slaughter. And the parents, because we're so consumed by this idea that I'm the power and I'm the authority, not thinking the child will grow up and leave, not thinking I might die today or tomorrow or I will eventually die. No, no, I'm the power, I'm the, and, and, and oh, constantly I'm so worried my child is not listening to me, therefore I am going through the hardest. And nobody's lifting up their head and said, hey, is this the biggest problem that your child is not listening to you today? The biggest problem is you're not communicating with your child what do you want from them? What's the only thing we communicate? I want from you to listen to me. خلص, that's the highest dream. Well, what kind of dream is that? That can happen in a five minutes. You don't need to dream. Wake up. <laughs> There's no need for dreams. Ah, خلص, do this. The child do it. Yalla, your dream came through. Is that your dream? You're not communicating with your child what you want from them. And that's why I will take this moment to educate us, the parents, about something 99% of Muslims don't get right and have this misunderstood. And because of that, the state of the ummah, in my judgment, is the way it is. This is the problem that manifests itself. Okay, so what's the problem with us, minority Muslim, that we, when we were learning Islam, we missed just one piece of information and it destroyed us. What's that piece of information? What's the difference between the purpose of our creation and the role of our creation? You know this sentence that I just said? Khalas, that's we're done. That's the Muslim Ummah problem when it comes to their understanding of Islam. Allah says in the Quran that I created the human for a purpose. To worship me. Abdullah ibn Abbas interpret the word لِيَعْبُدُونَ وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ قَالَ لِيَعْرِفُونَ So that they may know me. So Allah created us for a purpose. Number one, to know him. Number two, to love him. Allah loves when his servant loves him and builds his relationship based on love. Number three, to worship him. What is worship? It's an act of relationship, personal relationship between you and Allah. Worship is not like, this is a duty over my head. I have to pray five times a day. I have to fast Ramadan. Oh my God, that's so stressful. When can I? No, 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 no. Worship is a relationship. It's a joy. The Prophet ﷺ, when he used to get stressed, he used to get up and pray. The prayers was not the stress. The prayer was the release from the stress. Because you're talking to Allah. Do you present prayers to your children like that? Budu, salah, salah. You didn't pray. You didn't pray. To a point where your kids go inside the bathroom, close the door, open the water, splash water all over the place, and then they walk out and they didn't make wudu. <laughs> and then they pray. Because you know, no, you don't like water, right? And, and shaitan doesn't like water. And this is an innocent child. They will pretend they passed it. They, 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 uh, <laughs> they, uh, they, 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 they're cheating you. Like, so you know, you're looking at it like, wow, that was a very dry wudu. You're walking out of the bathroom, not a single drop of water. Masha Allah, masha Allah. You know, they didn't wash their feet, they didn't wash their hands, they just like washed like this, but the zero dropping, right? So why? Because you're constantly presenting salah and worship as an obligation. 
it is an obligation, but you keep on, you don't keep on saying it's an obligation. It's a relationship between you and Allah. We talk to Allah five times a day. We enjoy, we love it. It's a break. It's meditation. It's stretching. It's yoga got nothing on us Muslims. Yoga got nothing on us. I don't like yoga from a one perspective. Do you know? Because it's hijacking a religion. Imagine right now someone right here in front of our masjid, you know, if there is, let's say, a building for rent. And he goes and rents it. And he say, come, this is a club for, you pay $150 a month because five times a day we're going to do stretching. And then you go to the club and you tell them, you see them do what we do, qiyam, ruku', sujood. But they're not Muslims. How would you feel someone stealing your faith like that? Do you know what is yoga? It's stealing the prayer ritual of the Buddhist. You know when I sat down with two Buddhist monks in Santa Clara? They say there's nothing, nothing that infuriates us like seeing people playing with yoga. They say they take yoga. For us, we have to, we can only eat. You know Buddhists fast every day. They only are allowed to eat two meals. One before sunrise, one before noon. The rest of the day they can drink tea and water. They have to shave all the body of their hair, men or women. They cannot get married. They have to wear the clothes of ihram their entire life. Two pieces of cloth, yellowish. And they have to play martial arts to do discipline to their nafs, all to deny that desire. Any desire in Buddhism is bad, wrong. The whole Buddhism philosophy, because it's not a religion, is that pain and suffering comes from desire. Get rid of the desire, you will get rid of pain and suffering. When you get rid of the desire, not only you get rid of pain and suffering, but you get enlightenment. Finished. Buddhism finished. I explained it everything for you. If you get rid of pain and desire, if you get rid of desire, you get not only rid of pain and suffering, you get, you get enlightenment. So the whole religion is established on denying yourself. You cannot get married. You cannot drink anything addictive, not even tea or coffee. You cannot eat every day and indulge yourself. You can only eat twice and little bit and the rest is water. You cannot get married. You cannot do this. You cannot grow your hair. You cannot look good. You cannot wear clothes because all of that is desire. And any desire is haram. Can you handle that? So what do you go? You go leave all of that. Push, 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 and then you take the yoga, the stretching exercise that goes with all of that. Do you know how much they feel insulted because of that? As much as we will feel insulted, someone leaves the whole Islam and goes and open a club and start charging people 150. We're like, come here, we'll charge you free. <laughs> you read, they're doing the same thing. Like, it's very insulting. What is salah and siyam and zakah? It's a relationship. So Allah created us for a purpose, to know him. So that's a whole beautiful subject that can take literally a whole weekend and you will never regretting, regret having that, uh, to know Allah. Number two, to love Allah. And that takes a whole weekend. It actually takes a whole lifetime, forget a weekend. But it's, there's a beautiful way to explain it and you will never regret. Then to have relationship with Allah through the acts of worship. And number four, to obey Allah's laws. Khalas, this is haram, don't touch it, don't touch it. That's the purpose. But people, Muslims, think, if I fulfill the purpose, I'm done. No, you're not done. So let me give you an example, then go back to an Islam. And it's very important to get this example. From Adam alayhi salam to the last person who will live on planet Earth. Why does any business owner, whether he's a one-man show or a big corporation, why do they hire an employee? Can someone explain to me? What's the purpose of hiring. I am a one-man show business owner. I want to go and hire one person. Why? Why? Why do I hire? Huh? You want to feel that you have authority? You, 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 people hire just to feel that they have power and authority? That's a good point, mashallah. I never thought about that. Jazakillah khair. Yes. To get the work done. Tablish to get the work. Yani, mashallah, yani, ana, I have a business and I open a, you know, a, 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 a food truck and I can sell and make $10,000 at the end of the month. Mashallah, because now I go and hire somebody and pay him 5000 and lose 5000 Yani, why? Why do I go and hire another person? Just because of help? Huh? 
Do you see that word? Do you know why anybody in this world hires anybody? So that they can make more money. It's not about the help. If you're going to help me and I'm going to lose, I don't want your help. You understand? What's the purpose of hiring someone? Is to make more money. In corporate America, they have an equation. You have to make 10 times more than what we pay you. There's actually an equation in America. Most people don't know that because we don't know America. If the company does not make 10 times more than your salary, they'll fire you. You have to make the company 10 times than your salary. Some companies double the salary, triple the salary, but when you're talking about big companies that you know their names, they will enslave you. You have to make 10 times what they pay you. Tay, mumtaz. Otherwise, how do you think the company is going to make money? MashaAllah. So Apple goes and opens a company, and all the money that they make, they pay it to the employees. Allah. And that's why their stock goes up. They, you have to make 10 times of what we pay you. Otherwise, the company will shut down. Because everything we made, we give it to you and the other employees. Type. you went, had the interview, they said, we are hiring a software engineer. You went and I applied, they said, hired. Halas, hired. You went through the whole process, hired. Now, can you explain to me what will be your question after they tell you you're hired? How much are you going to pay? لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. You really need to go to some job training because that's what you should have negotiated before they hired you. You're gonna ask how much they're gonna pay you after they hired you. Somebody needs some business. You'd ask that before they hire you. It's too late. We're paying you ten thousand dollars a year. Oh, can't pay the rent. Okay. Why? Why do they? What is the first question after you agreed on the salary? What? This and that. What they hired you as software engineer. You got hired. What's your question? Huh? Indeed. What are my, what is my job? What is what? What's my job? I okay. You need a software engineer. Got it. You're hiring me to make more money. Got it. Okay. Now can you please tell me what's my job? Do you understand the difference between the purpose and the role? Do you know when you apply that to Islam, what's your purpose? To know Allah, to love Allah, to worship Allah, to obey Allah. But that's not your role. That's your purpose. So after you realize that's my purpose, so you ask Allah, okay, I got it. Thank you for the honor. Thank you for the chance to be alive. Thank you for allowing me to even know you and have a relationship with you and ask you. and blah, blah, blah. Thank you. But what's my role? And Allah answers that question with four words in the Quran. And that's what you need your kids to be raised when you grow your children. Not raise them, grow them. Why? Why? Do you know that, that point, the, the mindset I mentioned a little earlier, have a long vision for parenting, don't have a short vision? Do you know where I got that from? Genius. In the Quran, Allah showed us how, if Allah were to take a child, what would Allah do with the child? How would Allah grow that child? Never he used the word raise. Allah Azza wa Jal, when the mother of Maryam dedicated her child, she thought she was going to have a boy, she ended up having a girl. Why? Because the mother of Maryam asked for a special, special, special boy. The father is old, he died while she was pregnant. The mother is old, she Allah knows she will die after three, four years of this child is born. For you to have a special, special, special boy, you first need a special, special, special mother. So that's why Maryam had to come first. Then the dua of the grandparents will be answered. The boy will come from that girl. Isa will come from Maryam, not from Imran and his wife. Because they're not there to raise him. And that's why it's very dangerous. Like, you know, you know, it's a responsibility, but for our sisters, it's not a cliche. I'm not trying to, you know, blow your head and make you, give you a big ego. But really, it's a lot of it depends on you. Because when Allah wanted to bring someone special like Isa, he had to first bring a special mother, Maryam. Then from Maryam, Allah brought Isa, salam. What did Allah say when the mother said, Ya Allah, 
I grant my child to you. I want my child to be a liberator, a worshiper, a dedicated to you. Allah said, okay, thank you. I know you want a boy, but we need first to have a girl. So Allah said two things about the intention of Maryam. Allah accepted her in a good way. And then the second word is where the clue is. If you speak Urdu, can you please tell me what's the meaning of the word Nabat? Nobody speaks Urdu here? Huh? Uh, nabat. Plant. It's fluent, fluent Urdu. The old Urdu. Nabat means plant. And that's exactly what it means in Arabic. So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, how did Allah grow Maryam? He gave us a hint. I grew her like a tree. Never you plant a tree and you're looking at the tree. Where is the fruit? Where is the fruit? Can you give me fruit? Why you're so late? Why there is no fruit? No, you plant the tree. If you're lucky, after three years, you will get the first batch of fruit and it's not a sweet. The second one is always the sweetest. Obviously, some trees give you after one year, some trees give you after two years, some trees give you after three years. You can talk to the farmers about that, which, which fruit and vegetable. وَأَنْبَتَهَا نَبَاتًا حَسَنًا What do we do with our children? Robotic. Today. Right now. You're not listening to me. This, you're completely focused now and you forgot the vision. What's the vision? Why do we need to do nabat? Because we need to grow our children with their role in life clear. What's the role? <coughs> Number one, to establish justice on earth. Number two, to establish mercy on earth. And when I say establish, meaning institutions, teamwork, organizations, governments, systems, to establish what? Number one, justice on earth. Number two, mercy on earth. Imagine all the non-for-profit organizations and the work they do, that's all under establishing mercy. Number three, to establish moral excellence on earth. Moral excellence, because Allah knows that goes very far. And excellence in general. And excellence in general, meaning ihsan. And ihsan, the word ihsan in the Quran has three meanings. You will have fun applying ihsan with your children. It will make your life very beautiful. Number one, meaning of the word ihsan is when you make, when you do something good and beneficial. It's called ihsan. هَلْ جَزَاءُ الْإِحْسَانِ إِلَّا الْإِحْسَانِ فَبِأَيِّ آلَاءِ رَبِّكُمَا تُكَذِبِينَ Something does good to you. Shall you answer good except with good? Ihsan meaning to do something good. That's the first meaning of the word Ihsan in the Quran. The second meaning of the word Ihsan is to do it with, to the best of your ability with perfection. To do it to the best of your ability with perfection. Like you're, you don't be a perfectionist, meaning you don't do anything unless it's perfect. No, you do it to the best of your ability. Like you always improve yourself. You do it better and better and better and better until you master it. Third meaning of the word Ihsan is to do something beautiful. الَّذِي أَحْسَنَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلَقَ فَتَبَارَكَ اللَّهُ أَحْسَنُ الْخَالِقِينَ Ihsan means to do something beneficial. Ihsan means to do something better every time. It's aiming for perfection. And Ihsan means to do something beautiful. So, first goal is to establish justice. Second goal, to establish mercy. Third goal, to establish moral excellence and excellence in general, in everything. And fourth thing, Allah created us to convey the truth to mankind. To tell people about Al-Haqq, Al-Islam, and then leave them alone. وَقُلِ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ Say the truth is from your Lord, but how is the people going to know the truth? My dear brothers and sisters, including today, the 81 years old who became Muslim because his wife took shahada eight years before him, nine out of 10 when I give shahada and I ask people, why did you become Muslim? Nine out of 10, it's because I came to know somebody who's a Muslim and the rest is history. 
your actions, your, you telling people about Islam, then you embodying that Islam, the moral excellence, then you speaking the truth and not lying, and you standing up for justice, and you standing up for mercy, and being compassionate, and helping. Can I help you? Can I help you? Wallahi, in Saratoga, a sister took a, a shahada with me, and she's Filipino. Where do you work? I work on the reception in a company. Why did you become a Muslim? Seven years I'm working as a receptionist. 700 employees in the morning enter in this building and in the evening leave. No one cared or noticed me, asked about me, gave me love, gave me attention, brought me food, smiles, was there when I fell in trouble, except the Muslim employees. Especially two or three of them, especially one. And she said, I come from, I never thought I would convert to Islam. I come from very devout Catholic background. You know, the largest Catholic country in the world is the Philippines. And interestingly, the Philippines, uh, the Philippines is a, is a, is a, is a country that was all Muslim. You know, Philippines is 100% Muslim country. But when the Spaniards invaded here and had their first massacre, 1492, Christopher Columbus in August lands on the Caribbeans. After one week, he committed his first massacre. The Spaniards were so hungry for exploration that by 1519, they invaded the Philippines, which means they discovered North America, South America, they went under South America, they went up, and they went into the Pacific, and they reached the Philippine Islands, and they gave an ultimatum. You either become Christian, or we will slaughter you. And the Muslims fought and fought. In the Philippines, there's three major islands, and the capital of the Philippines, what's the name of the capital of the Philippines? Amanullah. That's the name, which became Manila. It's actually Amanullah. They came. And when you go to Manila today, the largest, biggest 70 feet statue of someone who has like a, a, a turban on his head and he's holding a shield and holding a sword and you read in the bottom, Raja Suleiman, the last Filipino prince fighter against the Spaniards. This is in the heart of, the, of, of, uh, of Amanullah, Manila. So they're not denying it. So what I'm trying to say is that Allah created us. Now, when you raise your kid, when you grow this kid, do you even have these roles in your head, in your radar screen? Are you thinking, I'm raising a kid to establish justice, and you learn what justice is. I'm raising a kid to establish mercy on earth. I'm growing a child to establish ihsan, moral excellence. I'm growing a child to establish and convey the truth. The whole thing is not on our radar screen. So what's happened? We raise very good, obedient kids that get very nicely and easily slaughtered. Chechnya, Bosnia, Palestine, Sudan, Yemen, Libya, Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, Burma, every country. It's like a conveyor belt. Massacre, 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 genocide, genocide. Why? Because we are raising very good, nice, polite children that listen to the parents all the time. We need to change that model. We need to be visionaries like Allah raised Maryam. Look at the goal. You will not waste your time disagreeing with your children on small things when you are preparing your children for justice, mercy, excellence, and spreading the truth. There's no time for small talk. Is not you will be from the child the stories that you will tell them the dream that you, inshallah tomorrow you're gonna become a doctor so you can make a lot of money and get married and i will show off in front of everyone that my child became a doctor mashallah mashallah where is that mother that you will say i want you to be a leader I, I expect from you, inshallah, when you grow up, you're going to become a leader. You're going to establish justice on earth. I will not be happy with you until you find out something to help mankind with, and you do it, and you do it well. All of a sudden, the child is growing with big dreams. Oh my God, my, 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 my role in life is to stop the massacres and the slaughter. Yes, 
Oh my God, my own life is to save the world? Uh, yes. Oh my God, my own life is to convey the truth to the world? Uh, yes. Oh my God, my role in the world is to show, lead by example and lead by moral excellence and do excellence in everything? Yes. Okay, then I got no time for small things. This is how the Prophet Wasallam raised Usama ibn Zayd, Zayd ibn Haritha, uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib, all of these, his children, Zainab, Ruqayya, Umm Kulthum, and Fatima. This is how he taught his wives. You know, his wives used to go with him to battles. You think he will be quarreling with his wife about small things? You put too much salt in the breakfast and on the eggs. MashaAllah. While people in Palestine cannot even, they dream of seeing an egg. You then make my eggs the way I like them. Oh, Wallahi al -Azim. What are we talking about? When you and your wife are going to defend the state, we, are you going to be pickering about that? So look, even Sayyida Aisha, when she grew up, she had some very, very strong political opinions. She ended up disagreeing with the Khalifa, with Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib. Then she said, I was wrong, and Sayyidina Ali forgave her and sent al Hassan wal Hussein to protect her, brought her back to Medina. The lady was thinking about politics, leading an army. Aisha radiallahu anha. And we're thinking about, you know, biryani, <laughs> food, clothing. My sari is more beautiful than your sari. My scarf is prettier than scarf. My, my food is prettier than, you know, my kids listen to me, your kids don't listen to you. Of course, we just want, and then we break the will of the child. Just obey, 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 obey. The child grows up without a will. Then you have tamed them so well that when they meet anyone in outside and they tell them anything, they also obey. Because they've never been taught how to say, no, I will not do that. So maybe we need to change our way of, of thinking and this whole big thing. I think I have fulfilled the purpose of my lecture tonight, which was mind frames, reframe and reframe the topic of uh, my lecture tonight. And inshallah, it was of benefit and enlightenment to you. Um, I would like to end here. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa al-Asr. Inna al-insana la fi khus illa al-ladhina aman wa amilu al-salihat. وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر جزاكم الله خير if you have any question right now you, because I know that you have to pick your children and parents had to leave I understand but if you have a question I will answer it right now inshallah let's take uh, maybe one question from brothers one question from sisters yes sister can you give her the mic if so that the people online can hear you uh, but that's okay go ahead I'll repeat your question what's my take on it uh, you, you brought a very beautiful point a lot of <laughs> Prophets in the Quran are raised without their fathers, right? Because the father is the one that instills the tradition. And that's why Allah made the Muslim father the leader of the house. Because these prophets had non-Muslim fathers. So Ibrahim, his father, alayhi salam, did not raise him because he was not a Muslim. But we assume if the father is Muslim, then everything is clear. And that's where his role becomes very important. So we also see in the Quran that Luqman, Imam Qari Umar read for us uh, in Salat al-Isha, Luqman speaking to his child, which we will use that example tomorrow. Um, you know, uh, 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 we find that uh, Ibrahim, alayhi salam, Allah told him to take Ismail away from him, but then he will visit him every year multiple times have conversation with him. He raised Ishaq, he raised Yaqub. We find that Yaqub raised his 12 children and raised Yusuf and Benjamin very well, and it paid off. Uh, we see that, um, uh, you know, and but we see the one that their parents were not Muslim, for example, like Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, out of Allah's mercy, that the father did not live to shape the child into a jahiliya mold or shape. So it was an advantage that Rasulullah lost his parents at a young age so that they don't shape him. Allah shaped him. And then the grandfather, two years and he passed away. He couldn't shape him. Allah shaped him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he grew up with a very strong fitrah, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. But there is that, there is that, uh, that what you said. So parenting is very, very important in the Quran because 
uh, as I said today in Khutbat al Jum'ah, most of the prophets and messengers, they, they, uh, they, their story, like uh, Musa alayhi salam, it was a parenting story. When Allah wanted to change the world, it was a child that will be raised in the house of the Pharaoh, right? So it's parenting, because because for the Israelites to get out of slavery, they need someone with a mindset, not a slave mindset. So it was Musa who grew up not thinking I'm slave. Then Allah sent him for 10 years with Shu'aib. He cleansed all the bad stuff away from the, that he learned in the house of the Pharaoh. Now Musa got the strength of the Pharaoh, but not their arrogance. Because he became shepherd for 10 years. He lost all of that arrogance. So the story of Musa is fascinating. And, and it is an indication for us that we should learn from others who even we might perceive as our enemy. That's the moral of the story of Musa alayhi salam. Story of Yusuf alayhi salam. He was raised in the house of Al-Aziz. First 10 years, formative years, because the father spent quality time. It lasted. He recorded, recorded, recorded for 10 years. After that, from 10 and above, he was a slave, servant, master, in the jail. It was playing what he recorded. So, but, but Yusuf had to learn the ways of the Egyptians. That's why he became the prince of Egypt. Just like Musa السلام, after him. So we should learn from the ways of the others. And just leave that which is not Islamic and keep that which is beneficial. So that's also part of uh, parenting, you know. Alhamdulillah. No problem. So uh, technology and that's used at school and learning has absolutely no video games. Did you grow up with video games? Yeah? Uh-huh. Did you play video games when you were a child? Yeah? Right. Yeah. So video games is something that you make a child maybe play for five minutes, ten minutes for educational reasons, but not the senseless video games. You don't balance. You are the parents. You decide what goes in the house. You give them a certain amount of time and you decide and the games that they play, they better learn something from it. Chess now is a game online. Right? You play against the machine. So it has to be a, a mind stimulation, not just a, what they call today addictive games, which is like, a, uh, you know, these shooting games and this and that. Uh, I forgot the name of this, uh, but uh, warriors and all of that. So, uh, no, I will not balance. I will present it with very small amount and I will not allow them to be addicted to it because modern science with brain scans, it shows how damaging is that to the brain of the child. So I will go with the science on that one. So don't feel pressured to balance. There's no balance. You're the parents, you, you decide what goes on. And you put the right amount, five, ten minutes, and you don't make it the highlight of the day. The highlight is when you go out and connect him to nature, not when he plays on the phone. Inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. Very good question, actually. Yes. Okay. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. May Allah bless you. Jazakumullah khair. And we see you tomorrow at 10 a.m. Inshallah you can make it. And I think there is also lunch that will be served. In the morning there will be coffee and refreshments, if that helps. And uh, inshallah we continue the journey. Tomorrow we'll go into the dynamic words. Tomorrow's title is Illuminating Words. The method, st dynamics, and style of parenting in the Quran and Sunnah, inshaAllah. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum.